Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you very much. I will uh, go ahead and lead us in tonight's Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America, 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 America and to the Republic, to the Republic for, which for which it stands, stands, stands one, nation, one nation, under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and, and justice, justice for all. For all. For all. At this time, we'll now move on to motions to direct the city manager to add agenda items to future agendas. Do we have anybody? Okay, seeing none. Or, no, count, no, or, okay. Seeing none, uh, we'll move on to public invited to be heard. We'll take a, a couple minute break here to allow people to call in. The screen will be put up with the number, I believe being 669-900-6833. And then there will be a prompt to enter the meeting ID, which is 879-1742-7855. So we'll give this a couple minutes and be with you in a moment. Mayor Pro Tem, we're just going to give it a few more seconds and make sure that the slide comes down from the live stream. All right, thank you. All right, looks like that is gone. And we have two guests when you are ready. All righty, I'm ready. I will uh, just a quick reminder for people to state their name and address and that we will be giving three minutes and I will let you know when you're three minutes up. Thank you. So we have two guests tonight. Uh, the first guest, your phone number ends in 396. I'm gonna unmute you. Please state your name and address for the record. You may begin, you have three minutes. Good Hello? evening, Mayor Pro Tem. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, go ahead. Okay, all right, uh, this is Scott with the uh, Longmont Chamber. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez and members of City Council. Uh, the Chamber supports City Council submitting to voters this fall an amendment to the Home Rule Charter to allow for the lease of city property up to 30 years. Last year, the same question was asked of voters but failed. First, in our Chamber's policy meeting, a number of our members had questions last year and again this year. We believe that many of these questions can be answered with better communication about what is being asked of voters and what extending the time from 20 to 30 years does for potential city and public private partnerships. Secondly, times have changed quite dramatically since last fall. None of us knows exactly what the post-COVID future looks like. It's possible that we will enter a time when it's difficult to attract developers for city and public private partnerships. By extending leases from 20 to 30 years, we can become more attractive. It is our understanding that 30 years is the norm for city leases in our region and around the country. The city of Boulder passed a similar ordinance back in 2012. Uh, the Chamber is interested in furthering conversations on this and is happy to help with communication on this important tool for future city projects. Thank you. Thank you. Our next guest, your phone number ends in 635. I'm going to unmute you. Please state your name and your address. You have three minutes. Hi, my name is Shaquille Dalal. I live at 609 Terry Street. Calling in to voice my support for Longmont Public Media, of which I'm a member. I don't personally view myself as creative in the way that people who are into making podcasts and videos are, but I'm interested in lots of community-focused things like local politics and community organizations. What I love about Longmont Public Media is that it takes the mission of public access seriously. Despite the fact that I don't have any real skills on how to make content, because LPM is a makerspace, I can easily find people to work with there who do have those skills and are maybe interested in the same things as me. It's why in the early days of the pandemic, I was able to quickly put together a series of interviews highlighting a few community-based organizations like the TLC Learning Center, Longmont Meals, and Wheel Meals on Wheels, and the YMCA, which were providing critical support to the community. Those videos were shared using Longmont Public Media's social media channels where they were collectively viewed over 2,500 times. It's not the sort of reach I could ever achieve on my own Facebook page. 
Public access media serves a really critical function. We live in a time of corporate media consolidation where it can be easier to find 20 podcasts about nightlife in Miami than it can be to watch a video of a concert performance here in Longmond. In a community as big as this one, an inability to share information and perspectives about ourselves to ourselves can really hold us back by making people feel like they're disengaged from the place where they live. The need for us to share with our broader community is exactly why platforms like Facebook and Nextdoor are so popular. But the fact that those tech platforms by make, make money by algorithmically creating animus is bad for a community. One thing that can really drive a community apart is the sense that it's not a community, that each person is an island in a sea of others. Longmont Public Media is the organization I know that is most aggressively working on stitching us together by providing an outlet for us to speak to each other. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there were only two callers, right, Susan? That is correct. All right, that will conclude public invited to be heard for tonight's meeting. Please join us next week if you'd like to have some comments in front of uh, the city council. Next up, we have special reports and presentations. Uh, so I think I'll throw this over to Harold, I think. Mayor Council, um, I guess we're gonna have another uh, weekly report on where we are uh, regarding uh, COVID-19. Um, I have um, brought um, the charts that I've normally used with you all so you can see consistency and movement. Are those charts up for you all to see? Can yes, I get ahead and not? Okay, good. So again, this is the same chart that I showed, that I've been showing you over the last few weeks when you look at the three-day average of COVID-19 cases. This is the three-day moving average and you can see the movement. I'm going to then show you the actual, I wish I could figure out how to get this where it would do it more quickly. This is what's happening on a daily basis uh, in terms of the number of cases. Again, this is by state. Uh, that really, we're moving through cumulative numbers. Um, and at this point, we're really watching what's happening on a day-by-day -day basis. This is again, the movement that we've seen in the number of deaths related to COVID-19. Um, again, an important slide, I'm going to show you this in Boulder County when, again, you look at um, where the, the number of cases are in, in terms of the state, and you can see that it's in the 20 to 29-year-old group where it's um, um, over 8,000 cases, um, and then you're starting to see uh, that they've had 11 deaths, 368 hospitalized in terms of this age demographic, and then if you remember what this looked like the other day, uh, there's been looks like um, some growth in this category as well, from a 10 to 19. This is the um, PCR percentage on a weekly basis, and you can see that when they look at it from a, on a weekly basis, it's, it's somewhere around 4%. Um, I also look at this in terms of a daily basis. Again, it'll take a little bit of time to move through here, and you actually see what's happening day to day. So you can see the percentage of tests is moving, um, and so we hit a, another recent peak of 5.84% there, but on uh, July 20th, it was 3.83% positive test. And so that's something that, that we like to see in terms of that movement. So while you see the growth in cases, you can see the movement in the terms of the percentages, and then it's starting to shift. And we hope that it's something that can continue based on the current data. When we look at the Boulder County numbers, um, Again, graphs that you're used to seeing. Um, and, and when we talk about numbers, I think it's also important to really, um, what we're trying to get focus, people to focus on is the y-axis. So it's much different in Boulder County than when we look at the entire state. But again, you're seeing the general trends and the curves that are very similar when we see the state's numbers. And you can see this peak, and then you can see as a county where we're, we're again, hope, starting to make a similar move that we saw here, and that we saw here. Again, we hope that that can continue as we're moving forward. Um, this is the five-day rolling average on the percentage of COVID-19 PCR tests with positive results. So you can see that, um, you know, we've theoretically, we've stayed below that 4% as Boulder County. We saw that peak where we got close, and then we moved, and then you see a rise. Um, but still in that area. You know, part of that then is also related to the number of tests that are being performed. And you can see where we're, we're really hitting in excess of 600 tests 
um, when needed and when folks are coming in. Then when you um, move to the demographics, you know, this is something that looks a little bit different when you compare it to the state numbers. Uh, when you looked at the state numbers, um, it was sort of this general trend that moved like this. In case of Boulder County, you see a, a high peak in the age groups of 20 to 29, drops in 30 to 39, goes up, and then you can see the move back. And so we look different in, in Boulder County in terms of where those cases are coming from. And you're really seeing the growth in this area uh, based on what that charts look like. Um, this is the five-day average um, on the number of, of new COVID-19 cases. Again, this is a good sign. You can see the peak, we move down, the peak, we move down, we have a peak and we're moving down. So again, those are things that you're wanting to look at over a longer period of time. So when you, when you look at some of the parameters in terms of protect our neighbor, I believe it's 14 days of declining cases before you can consider that. So we're still on that, that count uh, in terms of what that'll look like. And I'll touch on that a little bit later in terms of what that means for us and what we're looking at in timing. Um, this is the local look. Um, you may have remembered, I believe we were around 586. So we've crossed the um, 600 barrier in Longmont at 604. Um, Boulder's now at 646. I think when you look at the ages um, in that previous graph, and then you see where Boulder's increasing, you know, was I think a number of 30, there was a 30 difference, you know, see that move a little bit. Again, I think that's directly tied to the ages. And then as you look at this chart, um, if you remember last week, it was at 37% in terms of the Hispanic Latinx population uh, that had COVID cases, it's 36.8. So again, I think when you tie that to age, you're starting to see some movements continue. Um, and, and so we're watching the numbers. So, um, and then when you wanna look at what's happening in the system today, um, for the most part, everything is in green. Um, available med surge beds, again, there's still 120. Um, they're still doing elective procedures, so that's coming into play. I actually have the ability to, to see more granular information. But that's um, proprietary because it's by specific group um, units. Um, and then you can see the ICU beds where they're, you know, they're in the yellow, but as a system, you can see that we're still tending to move in, in the green. When you look at the state numbers, it's very similar to that. So it's much different here in Colorado than it is in some of the other communities where they've had increased cases. Um, remembered uh, last time I showed you all this graph. Um, and, and so I also wanna show it in terms of connecting, you know, what does it look like in Boulder County versus what does it look like in other places? Um, just to tell you, I chose other places that I've worked in the past just because I worked there. It was easy for me to see. Uh, there's no particular reason um, as I was looking at this data. So this is a little bit more in depth in terms of what we're seeing in Boulder County. Again, scale's important, you know, population of 300,000, 1,650 cases, 74 deaths. Um, and you can see the number of cases in the last 14 days in terms of that movement. Um, I started my career in Lubbock, Texas and went to school there. So I decided to pick that as another place. Again, about a 300,000 population, uh, 4,482 cases, 65 deaths. And again, you can see the movement here um, in a county that has a similar population. I then picked the last place that I worked, which was in Tom Green County. Smaller population, 120,000. 1,560 confirmed cases with 13 deaths, and then you can see the movement. So when you're seeing this in terms of the conversations that are happening in different locations, um, this is a website where you can go and you can get that information. You can even look at the counties in Colorado um, and, and see how that differs. Um, make sure I can I'm in the right spot. Um, so that's Douglas County, and then you can get a comparison in terms of if it comes up. Oh, 
what's happening in Douglas County. And, and so this is a good data set to come in just as if you want to start doing some compare and contrast and see what the movement is across the United States. Um, and so these are things generally we watch, but I wanted to go over the, the data with you all. Um, so you can, again, see the movement week to week in terms of what we're looking at, and what we're trying to um, watch on a regular basis. Um, are, is there any questions about the numbers? Councilmember Peck. Yes, ma'am. You're still muted. Sorry. Yes, okay. ma'am. So it's somewhat a general question in that I know that we get our uh, data from John Hopkins, and I'm I'm glad you do. But I I heard that that counties and other dis medical uh, uh, entities were not sending their data to John Hopkins anymore. Is that correct? Have you heard that? Um, I haven't heard that. So that's why when I look, I actually have another website that really focuses on Colorado okay. um, that I look at. And so if I see any differences, I'll let you know. Okay. Um, I do this because of the national comparison. And I think there are some that may be doing that. Uh, but again, the, the base data that I look at actually is on the CDPHE website, Boulder County Health website. Um, and then another one that I have to log into. I really uh, like seeing that from John Hopkins. It's very, very helpful. And I, I hope that we keep getting updates on it. So thank you. Uh, we'll update you on it. Um, if we see an issue in the data, we'll let you know. So some things that I wanted to talk about today. Um, uh, gonna, Harold, yep. uh, Councilmember Waters has a question. Okay. Sorry. Well, my question isn't about numbers. It is about what we're doing as a city. Should I wait? Is there, are you going to talk about what we're experiencing. You can go ahead. You can go ahead and ask. I mean, oh, so some of what my some of what's prompting my questions is, uh, as we have heard so much about in our um, continue to wonder, you know, where to, where school districts will come down or universities will come down with uh, their approaches to to going back to school or not. Um, it occurred to me I hadn't. I there are questions I haven't asked about us. That, I, that I, I'd like to know, and, I, and probably useful for maybe some others to know as well. I, I have no idea uh, who gets tested a, among the city employees, who, who gets tested? Does anybody get tested? And under, and what would provoke a city employee to be tested? Um, I may have Sandy jump in to help me a little bit with this. Uh, these um, are not gotcha questions. I'm just right, no, no, trying no, to get because... my mind wrapped around Right. what the city's approach is to the very same challenges that school districts are gonna face, at least in terms of their adults. Right, so I want her here to help me in case I missed something. So, okay. so generally what we look at is, um, you know, so the first case, and, and these are real examples. So someone comes in and says, my roommate is showing signs of COVID. Um, they're going in to get tested. We then connect them with Kaiser, who is our health insurance provider. They then talk to them and go through the process to get tested based on what the condition, what would it look like, or my roommate, my spouse is tested positive, um, or I was at an event where someone tested positive, and they go more in depth into um, is it a probable exposure, and a probable exposure is designed in terms of um, are you inside or are you outside? If you're inside within, you know, in excess of 15 minutes with someone and you weren't within the social distance and you weren't wearing masks, that becomes a probable um, scenario. A possible scenario is then a derivative of you were in, if you were inside a room or an office with someone, but you weren't there within 15 minutes, but people weren't wearing masks. And so then we go through that process. You've got tears. Tears. Yeah, um, that we look at, and then we're in communication with Kaiser on that. So in this case, employees don't have to pay for the cost of a test That's because part of the insurance it's part program. of our insurance program. Mm -hmm. um, under what conditions would an employee, an employee of ours, is tested positive? And you mentioned that the bulk of those would be our first responders. We have had first responders. To, right. What happens to their colleagues? Are they tested? Are they quarantined? Uh, what do we do with four or with uh, city employees when a colleague has been tested positive? 
So the first thing that we do, I mean, and we even do this with um, our recreation staff, if there's a person on the team or something, but so generally, um, Public safety is a little bit different because we know when we're going into calls that there is, you know, what what is the chance that there is a possible uh, contamination on this case? And um, so then if it were someone on staff, we would then go through the same questions that, that we just went through. Is it probable? Is it possible? Um, we would work with Kaiser. We would work with Boulder County Health, depending on what the situation is. We would get the individual tested. Now, when someone exhibits symptoms and depending on possible, probable, we then um, take certain actions within a, within a facility. And that was actually the first thing I was gonna talk about. So today, um, we had a situation where that occurred with someone whose significant other was there and, and they worked um, on the west side of the Civic Center. So we actually made the decision to close that side. We sent everyone home then based on our protocols, we'll come in, we'll disinfect that area. Sandy, if I miss something, just go stop. We will disinfect that area. Um, we'll then follow on the testing protocols, was it positive? We will then watch the others that are connected to them. And then depending on the advice we get from the healthcare providers and Boulder County Health, we'll then make the determination of when we open. It's also a little bit different in when you have something that occurs in one of the for daycare facilities. There's actually different protocols that we have to follow in terms of the amount of time that we have to have it closed. I believe it's 72 hours, Sandy, or somewhere in that, that time frame. So we have different protocols that we follow there. Um, so it, it's a lot of work and it changes based on what are the conditions and what are what is someone particularly, you know, potentially exposed to. But what we tell everyone, and it's pretty basic, if you're sick, stay home. If you're sick, Call your supervisor, call human resources. If you've been into work, let us know because then risk management and HR will work with the appropriate departments so that we can take the actions we need to based on the advice that we get from our healthcare provider and from Boulder County Public Health. Did I miss anything, Sandy? The other thing I would add, Harold, is that we follow the CDC guidance when it's time to clean an area. So for example, today we have a set of cleaning protocols that are part of our administrative regs and our folks follow that procedure to make sure that everything is um, is clean and ready to go from when we reopen. We have, are there any circumstances under which a city employee would be quarantined for 14 days? Yes. And when that happens, um, and I'll, I'll, I apologize to council members, I just, I'll, I'll try to get through this quickly. When that happens, um, uh, they're home for 14 days, is the, that doesn't come off sick leave, I assume? Sandy, help me on this one. I don't know if you froze. I, so we have to- Quarantine, they're usually quarantined for a couple different reasons. So for example, yeah. if, if their roommate has been tested and is positive for COVID and now they're waiting for their test to come back, that's a situation where we would quarantine them at home. And we have another temporary admin reg around pandemic pay and pandemic pay would pay for those kinds of situations where we sent you home either due to a building closure or for quarantine, or you have been diagnosed with, with COVID or are taking care of a family member diagnosed with COVID. And that's, that's actually um, the, the response that I was gonna say is that's outlined by federal and state law. And so and my, we have to follow federal and state law in terms of what's covered and why they're covered. So my last question is, uh, somebody has been tested positive They've been home, they've gone through whatever kind of treatment they're gonna go through. Uh, do we test them before they come back to work to make certain they're not infectious or uh, they're, there's, not, there's no risk of spread or? We let the healthcare provider determine what they need to do for that individual um, based on the circumstance. And, and you may have seen, it, it's the guidance is starting to change a little bit on that. And Harold, one thing that I would add is that our temporary admin reg basically says that after symptoms subside completely, um, we're asking employees if they have COVID symptoms to wait 72 hours before returning to work. If they're yeah. sick with something else, then we're asking them to wait 24 hours. Okay. And but there, where there's we, we don't do any hours. testing or we don't require the health care provider to, to document that there's been some additional testing. Yeah. All right, thanks. Uh -huh. And every one of these, every one of these cases, it's different. Um, I see more hands going up. 
Okay. Council member Udoga Farron. Yeah, actually, I had a question on that. Um, so the 14 days, and that was one of the demands that we as an education association put back on the state and our district leaders in looking at reopening, you know, the 14 days of declining um, positive cases. And there were some um, states who were pushing a 14 days, no new cases. Um, where are we at in Boulder? I was trying to look at that slide and count them, but you changed it. Um, let me pull that up. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> so, this is a question that I'm probably going to, let me share my screen. Mm -hmm. This is a question that um, I'm going to need to, to verify with Jeff. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this is where they start the count, which was on June. I don't know. I don't think, actually, I don't think it is. I think this is where they started yeah. the count based on what happened in Boulder and what we heard. So. Mm -hmm. Six. So six days from the, uh, this point, which was on June 14th, 15th ish. And then if we hit another elevation, so let's, you know, looking at the last um, date, um, if the next roll that comes in and it's higher, not to the highest peak, but to the, to the latest data point, if it's higher, we start all over again. Uh, that's where I need to talk to Jeff because I don't know it is so. You know, we went down and then when we went back up, are they considering this a movement upward? Are they considering this still the peak? So let me follow up with Jeff and get that information to make sure. Um, I know we've talked about it and, and I just can't remember that off the top of my head, but, but there's other issues on that too. Yes. So the other components that come into that, and that's really when you look at moving to protect our neighbor uh, that comes into play is it's not only the cases, but it's testing and it's the ability to do tracing. Um, so there are other factors that come into play in terms of um, making the move to protect our neighbors. Okay. And then the other question I had was, has there been any discussion with Jeff or other the epidemiologists or other um, um, other experts in the field around scenarios. What, um, you know, as schools either open full capacity, what do they anticipate? What are the project projections to the community at large or versus a hybrid or, you know, just sticking with online, you know, looking at those different scenarios, has there been discussion on any predictions? So I haven't been in any conversations with the school districts. I think that's been between the school districts and Boulder County Public Health. Okay. Um, I can tell you that, you know, we're obviously, um, you've heard, and we're going to have a presentation on the work that we're doing with BioBot. We're actually, that's shifting to a partnership with the universities. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what we're trying to do is look at, um, get the daily numbers for Longmont for, and relate that to the BioBot results, which is really um, we take samples at our wastewater treatment plant and it grabs the RNA. Um, it, they try to say it means X amount of cases, but the science is really, um, mm -hmm. I don't go there in terms of the science, but what we've looked at is a number of copies. And that sort of tells you the volume that's in your wastewater system. And so if we can track that over time, then what that kind of becomes is a leading indicator. Um, the, the thing that we do know um, you can see the peaks from when people engaged in activities. So this peak in this area is right after the 4th of July. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you saw the peak that occurred associated with the parties and you, you can see what's happening in, in, in Boulder. So, you know, those are the things that we're walking there or watching. There's also some really interesting science coming out. Um, studies that you're starting to see, uh, I think it was with the PLOS, that um, and if you get a chance, look at it. There's also articles on various news platforms about this study, and they say there's three things: wash your hands vigorously and on a regular basis, wear your mask, and social distance. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 those components come into play. Um, what I can tell you is, we're there's the, we I talked to my 
other colleagues in Boulder County um, on, a, on a weekly basis. And so we're going to probably, we're going to have those conversations. Um, and then there's, there's the likelihood we may institute the larger conversations um, based on where the data is going. So we'll know more. Mm -hmm. We're planning for all of those scenarios and locally, or at least that's what we're thinking. I mean, because we are not in silos. Whatever the right. school district does, it impacts the community at large. It impacts our um, our elderly residents, people who, who don't have children in school, they're still impacted. So it's really important that we have that connected under, you know, understanding of, okay, what are you doing? This mm -hmm. is what we're doing and have that clear transparency. That, you know, that was another one of our demands is having that data, um, disease data. If there is an outbreak in the classroom or in a building that the community knows, parents know, other staff members know, and it's, um, and it's out there. So that's, and are we in a position to, to be doing that right now? If we are not, then we should not be opening up right now. And for us, it's even larger than just the local school district. So to give you a sense of what we're having to take into account when you look at federal state laws, who you take care of, and those types of issues, we know that um, our team, we have members in Thompson Valley, Poudre Valley, St. Vrain Valley, Boulder Valley, um, Adams County, probably the Aurora School District, Weld County School Districts. And so the other thing we're having to do is actually also look at what those other districts are doing um, because that then fundamentally impacts how we're going to approach staffing um, and, and how we're going to handle our daily operations because we have to be cognizant of the impact on, on families and daycare. And you, you heard me talk about daycare before. Um, so that's a piece that we're looking at to try to figure out what's happening in all the other school districts uh, because we know it'll impact us. Um, Kind of wanted to touch on a couple of points. So many of the questions that you all talked about came up. We closed uh, the west side of the Civic Center today based on the very issue that you talked about in terms of testing. So the finance side in that area, um, we had to make the decision to close it and go through our protocols. Not the first time we've had to do it, won't be the last time we've had to do it, um, um, but we just went through and followed our processes in terms of how we needed to approach it. Um, and I was actually going to bring it up to answer many of the questions you asked. So thanks for, for doing that. I see other questions, Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, Council Member Christensen. Uh, Harold, I have the same questions. I mean, about the, I think we can't underestimate the school, the schools, and also Front Range Community College, which is mm -hmm. the age group where most of the people who are carrying this uh, are going. But, um, as a, I think the city has done a terrific job at taking care of city employees, but we really need to be working with the school system and uh, P Boulder Public Health to see, uh, to have a plan for uh, when the schools open up. Um, if this, so far we've been very lucky in that smaller kids by and large are having a very low rate of this, but we don't want that to change because that would be a disaster. And so I'm just worried that we are not going to be prepared for um, schools to open up and uh, a whole lot of people to get sick and then carry it home to their, uh, their families and yikes, that could just be, you know, I don't know. I, I, I was, I was hoping to talk to Susie earlier today about this, but I don't know if she knows what the plan is, but we really need to have a plan and St. Vrain School System really needs to have a plan for what's gonna happen in terms of public health if things don't work too well when schools do reopen at, on any level. So I, that's my greatest concern is that we don't have sick kids and sick families and uh, that'll just, undermine everything we've worked so hard to try to get uh, stabilized. So what I can tell you and what I know is the way the governor's order was issued and I think Eugene's on 
Um, by the way, Eugene and his legal staff have been great in terms of distilling these orders because um, I will tell you, it, it becomes maddening at times, but um, the way I understand that the order was issued in terms of school districts, it actually vested the decision within the superintendents. Um, and um, what I can tell you is part of the reason, you know, we normally have Jeff here. Um, Jeff has been knee deep into conversations with both school districts. Um, and, and so I told, you know, I, I'm going to carry this until Jeff gets through this. Um, so I know he's in conversations. I know he's working on those issues. Um, you know, from my experience with Jeff, um, he's going to say what he thinks in this. Um, we've all seen it when he's issued masking orders and he's done these other things. Um, so I know he's actively involved in those conversations now. Um, and all I can tell you is um, I'm not in those conversations, um, but I can tell you the world's changing because I just heard that Denver made the decision to go online and delay their start date. I think Jefferson County um, has indicated they're evaluating that. So I think there's a lot of flux right now, um, not only in Colorado, but nationally in terms of how schools are looking at it. But as soon as I hear something um, that I can verify, I will let you all know. We're obviously gonna be very interested in the same conversation that occurs tomorrow. Uh, that you all are in and but as i stated earlier we're not just going to watch it for st Ray valley uh, we're going to watch it for boulder valley and all the other school districts where we have staff members with kids because um it may be a an interesting first month or so uh in terms of how we figure out our operational plan if we have different plans in different areas um, speaking of that, and sort of, a, if I can, if there's not any other questions on this, the one thing I did want to talk to council about is, so when we look at Safer at Home and we look at Protect Our Neighbor, you know, the governor has delayed um, uh, the consideration of any request to move into the Protect Our Neighbor phase, which uh, for a couple of weeks, which we know that's now going to put us into the month of August. We know the case growth numbers that we have to look at and all of the parameters. Um, and, and so we know the month of August is probably highly unlikely uh, based on what we're seeing that we'll move in to protect our, our neighbor, which means we're still in safer at home. And even when you move into that world of protect our neighbor, this is really a conversation about how we approach uh, council meetings in August. And so I wanted to touch base with you all on this. We have run different scenarios as we looked at it. Um, if you get a chance, um, they're finishing up with the room. The challenge is um, the social distancing. You know, if you can't do that or if it's close, then you're wearing face mask and, and how you hear and those types of issues. You then have to run a space calculator on the room to see how many people can fit in it. And then you have the broader issue of people that are in the high risk population based on the caseloads. And, and so at this point, at least as I've talked about it with my staff, um, we really think we probably would be best in August um, to stay um, in this Zoom environment based on everything that we're seeing and what we're doing. So that would be um, my recommendation. I just wanted to get council's feedback on that or answer any questions I could on it. And that's just a pure look at the world, the data, where we are in the process. Councilmember Christensen. I am so eager to get back in council chambers, but you know, I, um, I don't see how we can use the council the way it is, the setup that it is we would have to do a huge amount of work again to try to set it up to be enough social distance, enough distance, physical distance between us. I can't imagine how to do that. And then we would have room for only maybe half the people uh, that it would normally fit. You know, so rather than go back to that and have some interim that is just also extremely frustrating. You know, I agree with you that it's probably a safer thing for everybody. Plus we have people 
on council, I mean, I'm 70. You know, we have people who are at, um, who are more vulnerable, uh, people who have immune problems and things like that. So, uh, you know, I understand. And I think the town will understand too. I, I, I'm sorry about it, but I don't think we should, we've already done the uh, kind of thing at the library, which was an enormous um, stress and a lot of trouble for staff to set up and tear down every single week. I don't want staff have to having to do that all over again with the with the chambers and um, measuring out things and trying to monitor people so they don't you know get too close to each other. I I think you know we should probably just keep doing Zoom for a while until we can actually uh, reasonably get back to chambers. But that really irritates me. But you know, that's life. <laughs> yeah, and part of the reason why I wanted to bring this up, um, some some councils are meeting. Uh, so I don't think anyone in Boulder County's meeting. Um, and so, you know, it's it, it's a difficult question. Um, I've talked to folks about a, a hybrid model of Zoom and people coming in. Technically, that's a nightmare. Um, is what what I've heard from even our staff. So that's why I wanted to bring this conversation point up to you all. Council Member Peck. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I agree that we should stay virtual and I have to hand it to Susan and your staff that I think we've got a pretty good handle on how to work this now. And uh, I think it would be the wrong message if we're at a safe at home, stay at home through the governor, but we don't do that. So um, I'm all for doing the virtual until the governor lifts that protocol. Council Member Waters. I would just say ditto. Uh, and I, I, do, I do think the message, the point that Council Member uh, um, Peck was making, uh, that we ought not to say one thing and do another. We ought to set an example. And, and I think until uh, until we're willing to encourage others to reconvene in, in face to face in real time, that that this format uh, works as well, or works well enough for us to do the people's business, and um, is one that protects health and safety not just of us, but others who would show up in the council chamber. So, I think that's the right. Harold, do you need a motion or just no, I was just, um, that was my recommendation. I just wanted to, you know, this can be a, a difficult conversation and wanted to get your feedback and um, we, we can just continue in this. I think what I'm going to do is look at it on a month to month basis. If we move in to protect our neighbor, then that may be a trigger point where we bring it back to you based on moving into that phase. Um, but again, there's other considerations that we're always having to, we all have to look at that as an individual in our own situation as well. So those are all things we have to manage. Yeah, I just say real quick that uh, until we can resume in person meetings with absolute confidence that we can do it safely. I think it's just prudent to continue to meet virtually, per se. Uh, I believe I saw council a bunch of hands went up. Um, council member Edogle Ferry. Um, you know, I'm just going to agree with what everyone else has said. I think as long as we are under safer at home, um, we really need to be continuing with the virtual and then we can re, you know, have the conversation again once we move to the protect our neighbor phase. Okay. Um, and that's sort of a, a transition into the new order. So the, the, the state order in terms of masking. Um, so we have two orders in play for us. One you have the state order for masking indoors. Um, Eugene and his folks are working with the county to try to get some answers because there's there's a change in there for us. Um, so we were under the county order that said you needed to wear a mask if, if you couldn't adequately social distance six feet apart. This says we need to wear it unless you're in your office. So we're trying to get some nuances in what that means because the example I will use when Sandy and I we do my WebEx with the organization. We do those weekly. 
where we open it up for any our organization to, to talk to me. We're six feet apart um, and we were in that environment. That order may have changed that. So now when we were watching that, at least for the last few days, we've been all wearing our mask, which has almost pushed us back into the team's environment because it's easier to communicate. Um, and if you have my hearing, good luck. Um, so they're trying to distill that piece of the order and um, they're working with the county and it's really the county doing the work but and asking questions of the state, but we're trying to get more clarity in terms of what that means to us and how we do it. But there is a question of, so how's this going to work? Um, and just so you all know what we've been informed, again, subject to change is that if individuals have concerns about businesses or facilities, um, those calls will continue to go into Boulder County Health through the process that we've utilized on the business side. They then will engage with jurisdictions if they need our support to deal with those issues. But the difference is it really is up to me or our building managers to ensure that we're complying with the order in our facilities, just like it is in other locations. Um, and if there's a problem that goes into Boulder County Health, um, and then we and then we move forward on this. All that being said, we're still really trying to manage those that are working remotely um, because we are trying to do what the governor's asked us to do in terms of maintaining the 50%. It's becoming harder as we open different components up, but we're still really engaged in that remote work uh, to the best of our ability. And so we are just adjusting things slightly as an organization as we move into these other phases. Um, so still trying to understand as we get more information, as Eugene can brief us on this, we will then hopefully be able to provide you with more. And I know the county's trying to do that as well. Council Member Martin had her. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask uh, when we do move back into chambers, are the, the distances between um, the different seats on the council dais and also the, the seats, are they the same or as they were before or uh, have they been moved farther apart? Oh, Sandy, <laughs> you, know the, you know the details on that one. That was your project. Council Member Martin, uh, Sandy Cedar, Assistant City Manager, the, it's about the same. Um, there is there's not there is a little tiny physical barrier between uh, council members before and that's not there. It's one big kind of long dais table. Um, and I measured out today. I just was there today. And it looks like it's about two feet, two and a half feet um, on each side for council members. So it's definitely not a, it's not a six foot. It's not a six foot gap at this point. And when you look at the, the seating area, um, so we've got permission to open the museum, but we had to run through the calculator in terms of how many people you could have. I think I've said this to you all, when we ran the calculator on the Stewart Auditorium, seats 250 people. I believe the number that we actually came out with in that calculator was 50 based on that configuration. We've talked about having to go through then the same seating calculator in terms of the area where the public can sit, then that also includes where staff can sit. And then you have to look at that calculator in terms of the civic center and what that looks like in case you had more than that come in play. So the answer is uh, a lot of details you have to go through in order to, to pull the trigger on some of these items. Council Member Peck. Thank you, um, Mayor Pro Tem. Harold, this is a little bit off the topic, but it does go back to the school protocol a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I had an email and I'm sure that it went to everybody on council, but it's basically a woman who has a therapeutic dance studio for uh, physically and mentally disabled people. She's concerned about, uh, I consider this because they have to enroll as right. a And there are probably other scenarios that are kind of the same. And if you don't know the answer, I'm, I'm wondering if you would ask Jeff Zayak, how do we answer our constituents on this issue? Are we going to wait? Um, for them, it's a health issue as well, because they not only 
because of the virus, but because of their disabilities. So uh, that they need to continue this therapy. So when you have an answer from Jeff or from the school district, would you relay that so that any other uh, enrollment type classes that are outside of a school district supervision, how do we answer that? I'm so I think I got that email too, and I, I, I replied, I don't know, but I, I want to facilitate a conversation with the um, health department. Um, okay. That's really an area where even we've had to do that with our own programs okay. um, and get into some details. And so I want to facilitate that conversation. Great. And I would love to for you to come back and let yep. us know how we should help yep. our residents. Thank you. Councilmember Hidalgo Faring. Um, Harold, when you are getting, or you, you know, as you guys are trying to figure out the city, um, the 50%, the spacing, um, governor's orders and county and state recommendations, are you finding conflicting messages and guidelines? Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, because in the school, you know, we're hearing what we hear is, okay, you need to be six feet social distance. And even as we were talking about our own areas if in, in council chambers, two to three feet. So we're told that in the reopening of schools, we can have two to three feet spacing with desks. But so that goes against what the CDC recommendations was with the six feet and what businesses are being told. So yeah, yeah, I just, I don't, I don't feel we're in a good space to really look at reopening schools right now and until these conflicts and inconsistencies are, um, are addressed and we get a clear message instead of guidelines. You know, I'm going to ask Eugene to answer some, Eugene's a part of some of the other conversations that I'm not part of. Um, and I may ask Eugene to jump in and speak to some of those issues, but are there conflicts? There are. There are. I mean, we saw early on when they opened bookstores, but they said you couldn't open libraries. And we we're trying to understand, well, how can you open a bookstore but not a library? I mean, we, we're constantly moving through those, um, those, those situations. Eugene, do you have any added information? Uh, Eugene May, city attorney. Uh, I do. I mean, we're getting used to this after four months. So, you know, I know schools is a very important issue. They issued the guidance yesterday. The pattern with the state is they issue this guidance and these public health orders, then they get feedback. And then, they, you know, we're up to the eighth amended safer at home. And so, you know, the cadence seems to be on these major orders that they tweak them through amendments every one to two weeks. And so, you know, I think that there's gonna be a change to the masking order, for instance, because there's a lot of industry specific guidance uh, about masking and in close proximity, you don't have to wear a mask, yet this new public indoor spaces definition seems to indicate that you need to wear a mask all the time indoors. So, um, I think it's an iterative process and it's a hard call. I mean, it's a hard call for the state. I don't want to be in their shoes. And I think people are just starting to digest it now. Um, you know, Boulder County Public Health has been awesome to work with. Mm -hmm. And I asked them four questions about the masking order yesterday. And they're like, yep, those are our questions too. You know, I think we're in the clarification phase on the masking order. And that came out last Thursday. So I think there is a clarification phase for the school guidance too, and people are just getting to it and looking at how to operationalize. I think the school order, very much like protect our neighbors, is pushing decision-making down to the local level because counties are moving in different directions now. Um, and the governor wants to give that flexibility to counties and school districts where, you know, if your numbers are good, you can do, your reopening plan could look like this. If your numbers at countywide look bad, then you have to have a different sort of protocol um, in place. And so, you know, it's very fast moving, you know, school openings a month away. They got this guidance out yesterday and people are figuring it out 
and getting feedback to the state. And, you know, I, I will give them credit and I'll give Boulder County Public Health more credit too, because they hear our concerns. They have daily calls with CDPAG. If you have specific questions, feed it into us. We are working very closely with the Boulder County Attorney's Office. Um, you know, some of these bigger policy questions mm -hmm. are above the attorney's pay grade. You know, they're the Jeff Sayak type uh, CDPHE conversation. I mean, I did hear from Boulder County Public Health that the school conversations were held very closely to the, to the vest. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And now it has become public and now they're getting the feedback. So, um, you know, that, that's my experience after four months with these public health orders and it's shifting sands. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we can't sit here today and, you know, I'm pretty sure it will change. That That's the only thing that we're sure mm -hmm. of is that these things just keep on moving and getting better because of feedback. Uh, and the state and the county have made clear on Protect Our Neighbors. They want more local input because it's going to be locally driven. I think the same sort of strategy or philosophy would hold true with uh, school guidance too. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. And, and now what I would say too is, Jeff looks at the data um, and there's new data coming out right now. Um, and, and, and as a parent and as someone who is in this world, I'm also looking at, well, what happened in Israel with the data there? You know, it, what, what's that saying? Um, and even today, um, when I had a little bit of a break, there's other data sets coming out. So um, I think that's the other challenge. Um, but what I can tell you um, that I think if Jeff didn't agree with something, I, I know he's told me when we've, we've asked for different options and, and they said, no, we don't really think, I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't avoid that conversation. Um, he's great to work with and we work through these issues, but um, they've given good advice and, and, and been very clear with us too in terms of what we're doing. So that's, that's good that he calls it like it is and he's more interested in giving out the facts right. and recommendations over what he thinks we want to hear. And that's, I mean, that, that's going to be key. But again, you know, like you said, we have several employees who have children in other districts. So while I appreciate that local control, what one district does or what one county does impacts the neighboring areas. So, you know, I just, I, I guess I'm having a hard time with, you know, I, I haven't helping sift through 800 plus teacher surveys of what the concerns are. We've had teachers already put in for early retirement. People are afraid and, you know, and we need clarity, we need transparency and, and we need, we need um, public input as well. So thanks. Yeah, and I, just to give you a sense on the data, a story came out 44 minutes ago about cases in infants in, in one county in Texas. And that's how fast this is changing and they're trying to keep up with it. Um, they've got a tough job, they really do, um, but they've been great partners. Other than that, there are quarter shortages. <laughs> We've been searching for quarters for our housing authority washing machines. And so um, it's just it's just interesting how you run into these things of, you know, you're working these issues on testing. And then the next thing you know, we need to get quarters for the housing authority laundry areas. And, you know, you're just all over the place. So I thought that would be a funny one to just kind of show, talk to you all about. Or we chase everything from quarters to how do we go through testing? That's all I have. All right, thank you, Harold. Uh, we're gonna move on to study session items. Uh, start with 6A, update on Longmont public media structure and governance. Hi, Mayor Pro Tem, Sandy Cedar again, Assistant City Manager. Um, I would like to introduce Scott Converse from Longmont Public Media. Um, I think General Executive Manager, he can, he can remind me of his title. <laughs> Um, but essentially, this was a report that was supposed to come to you in March um, during the first meeting where we decided that all special presentations and everything were going to be scrapped because uh, we could only have 10 people in the room at the library. You may remember I was running 
in and out of the doors trying to not be the 10th person. So, <laughs> so after much ado, I would like to introduce Scott Converse from Longmont Public Media. Scott, go ahead. Hi guys, can you hear me okay? All right, um, General Manager, Longmont Public Media. Um, and what we're gonna do tonight is a six month update on where we're at with Longmont Public Media and where we're headed. So uh, could I get the first slide? So as I said, a six month update. So we're gonna just dive right in. Uh, as uh, most of you know, we took over all the old broadcast equipment. Uh, on January 1st, we didn't have any training um, or any handoff whatsoever. It literally was dropped in our lap and uh, they said go and we went and everything worked. We got it all to work, we figured it out. And we've been up since day one uh, of January 1st. We have maintained um, and broadcast on channel 880 from January 1st to frankly today, not just January, July 1st, but to today uh, with very, very few downtimes, uh, basically planned downtimes that had to do with updates, um, having to do with adding uh, new features to the software. And of course, since these servers run on Windows, you have to reboot them periodically. And we time those to happen late at night, early in the morning. So there's no interruption of programming. We do broadcast live city council meetings, planning and zoning meetings, as well as uh, school board meetings. Next slide. Uh, we also, as you may recall, plan, uh, provided an unplanned for and unfunded remote city council broadcasting system for the library, uh, which uh, we did not know about until after we'd signed the contract and um, had to figure out a way to make that happen, which we did. Uh, we have begun the process of recording and transcribing and broadcasting all 17 of the boards and commissions. Uh, and we had started going to the meetings and we had started doing the recordings and COVID hit. So right now what's going on is those meetings have largely been canceled. Some of them have started up again. Susan can tell you which ones are actually happening and they're all happening with Zoom. And what we're doing with those is Susan will record them she uploads them to the LPM website. We then process them uh, using our voice to text uh, software to get the transcripts and we upload them to our website and we schedule them for playback on channel 880. We also um, transcribe all of the city council meetings, voice to text, and that is also posted uh, and publicly available on the LPM website. So if you go to like this meeting, on Friday, uh, the video will be up on our website and the full text of everything that you guys said will have been transcribed into, um, into a, a text file that you can search and read through. Next slide, please. So these are some pictures of some of the stuff we do there. That's John Ellsworth in the top left corner there uh, in front of a green screen. He does a weekly weather show, just like you see with um, the, the maps and you know, the weather lady, you know, showing the map and, and waving her arm around. That's precisely what John does as well. John is a NASA uh, rocket scientist during the day and has a full um, observatory in his backyard uh, <laughs> for fun and uh, knows more about weather than anybody I've ever met. He's one of the biggest weather nerds on the planet, I think. And he does just amazing stuff and he does it for fun. He's one of our members and um, he's been doing this for quite a while. He also wrote uh, a, a weather article for the Longmont Observer, and he also is doing the same thing for the Longmont Leader now. Uh, the next picture is uh, most of our staff and one of our interns actually getting set up for one of your meetings right now. That's the control room over at LPM. In the middle left, that's Craig Stevens with Mike Butler, and I think that's Glenda Jackson. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a little bit, but that's a community conversations um, program we're starting up. Uh, you can see Mike Foote with Marsha there doing an interview. He was not very comfortable by the end of that interview. It was a, a kind of an interesting, tough interview. We did, you can see Tim Waters doing a backstory show down in the bottom left corner. The podcasting studio is in the bottom left, I'm sorry, bottom middle. So we have a podcasting studio. Anybody can come in and record podcasts. Eric Ozempa from the Longmont Community Foundation until we shut down the building during COVID had started using that to do his and we had a whole bunch of other people starting to do podcasts in that room. We also have a full-time radio station that plays those podcasts from our website 24 seven. And if you look at the bottom right, that's, that's the library setup. When you guys were over at the library doing your city council meetings from there during the beginning of the council build out, we um, designed a, a complete 
mobile broadcasting system that ran out of that space right there. So next slide, please. Um, as you know, we are trying to create a membership-based media maker space. Um, and it initially started faster than Tinkermill did. And I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with Tinkermill. It's um, that something that I started with a bunch of other people here in town uh, back in, I think, 2013-ish timeframe. And the first meeting we had at Tinkermill was six people. The first meeting we had for Longmont Public Media was about 15 people. And it grew pretty quickly. Uh, by the time we had gotten to the end of February, we had 50 or 60 people on a weekly basis in our member meetings. And it was starting to really take off and then bam, COVID hit. Uh, we have opened the building up to the general public with um, free access to studios and to video editing software and hardware, as well as equipment like microphones and cameras and lights and um, like the podcasting studio we talked about. So all of that's available to the general public. That was initially available when we first opened and it shut down for, I don't, I think it was about three months that we shut down like everyone else, same time you guys did basically. And then uh, we opened up again and right now, I believe we're allowing five people in the building uh, mem as members and you have to sign up through the website to come in. You can like say, I'm gonna be there from you know, one to four o'clock or whatever you want. Uh, and um, that's available now currently to the general public as well as to our members, but we don't know how much longer that'll be. Same as you, um, whether or not buildings stay open or not is to be determined based on how this pandemic goes. We also opened the ability for people to broadcast onto Channel 880. Uh, really, it's a much far and wider and a broader audience um, for the community to be able to take content and put it in. So we have a website form that you can fill out and you can upload your video um, directly to us and we will review it, obviously. But uh, in general, anybody who wants to get their video uh, up on Channel 880 can very easily do it by literally filling out a form and uploading a file. Next. Slide, please. One of the things the contract asked us to do is to create a website. <clears throat> and we decided that we're gonna make as comprehensive a one as we could. So we live stream um, Channel 8 and 882, uh, our website uh, at longmontpublicmedia.org. And we also live stream directly to YouTube, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And um, you can, if you want, if you have a smart TV, which most people do it, and all of them have YouTube on it. You can do a search on Longmont Public Media YouTube and it will bring up the live stream for Channel 8 on your smart TV. I have a Fire TV, an Amazon Fire TV, and I just go uh, Longmont Public Media YouTube and it literally goes out, finds it, and brings that up and starts playing it. Uh, so you don't even need Comcast to watch Channel 8. You just need a smart TV. And I, I'll, I would challenge you to buy a TV today that doesn't have a YouTube capability in it. So the reality is there's 19,000 Comcast um, customers out there, but there's 100,000 people in Longmont. And I'll bet you 60, 70,000 of them have a smart TV. So we have, a, we have good potential reach if we can get them to understand that we're here. Um, we also have archives of all the videos that we create on our website. So it's very easy to get to those videos. Um, they are, as soon as they're created, we upload them to Vimeo, which is our um, private uh, backend system. And we also upload them to YouTube as long as we have the correct rights for it. And we make those available to anybody who wants them. Uh, if they are city videos, uh, city council meetings, um, or boards and commissions, we also run them through a voice to text uh, artificial intelligence program that pulls the, uh, the text out of the voice and we'll post a transcript with each of those videos on that website. We also have a live schedule of videos playing on Channel 8. And um, we just got this thing working correctly with Comcast. We've had it running for a while on our website where every day, we, sometimes we will make changes in the middle of the day of the schedule and it updates immediately on our website. Comcast, we're not sure how often they pull from that. We finally got them to actually come and pull the scheduling from our systems about maybe three weeks ago, four weeks ago, and we've been working on it literally weekly with them to try to get them to do it, and they finally started. And we think it's daily, but sometimes it seems like it's weekly. So if you go, if you go to Channel 8 on Comcast, the show that's playing probably matches the description, but it may not. And if it doesn't, it's not because we didn't do it right. It's because Comcast hasn't updated recently. Um, so we also... Um, as I said earlier, we have a, a live internet radio station. So if you go to the website and click on radio, you'll be able to listen to 
um, hundreds of hours of podcasts that have been created in Longmont. Um, so we have that live radio station and it's also recorded stuff. So anytime you want to do a live radio show, we can do that from the podcasting studio. And we also take all the podcasts that are created and that people want to make available and we make those available on, I guess you would call it LPM radio. So um, as I said earlier, anyone in the community can uh, connect and commit, can connect and submit videos. And you'll see that slide there. That's a link that takes you straight to that um, that uh, form. It's a very simple form, 12 questions, things like name, address, do you uh, have rights to let us have this video? Uh, if you were to rate this from a G to an X, where would it be? Luckily we get mostly Gs, never gotten an X. Um, and um, we also allow Makerspace members, including free level members, so you don't have to pay for any of this, to reserve and schedule specific resources at LPM, which includes a studio, you know, we have three studios currently, four actually, uh, cameras, equipment. So anybody who wants to access what's happening at LPM and what's available at LPM can do it. Next slide, please. These are some screenshots of the current website. So if you look in the bottom left corner, that's, that's what the page looks like uh, for live TV. You can of course full screen that um, and it will blow up to the full screen. The video archives page is in the middle and up uh, an example of the live schedule is on the right. You can scroll through that and you can go forward and backward in time. Uh, and uh, generally we schedule for about a week out. We schedule Friday mornings uh, for the, through to the following Sunday. Uh, and generally try not to change that too much, but we can if we have to. Like for instance, if there is an emergency, something happens, the police department wants to put a bulletin of some sort up, we can change those types of things. So next slide, please. So this is an example of a bunch of the content that uh, we create. Um, so a lot of it's local. We really focus as much as we can on local, but it's also important that we do uh, the um, state and national whenever we can. So we do city council, planning and zoning, boards and commissions, uh, the school district. We are currently doing a live streaming show from the Longmont Museum every Thursday night at 7.30. We're uh, called the, the Longmont Museum Summer Concert Series. And uh, what we do is we show up there with a multi-camera setup. We take a live feed from the band itself and we live stream it to Channel 8, to the museum's Facebook page, to our uh, YouTube channel. And we record that for later um, posterity and rebroadcast. So uh, we've been, I think we've got done five shows so far and we have two or three more left to do this month. I believe we're also doing a virtual um, concert with the LDDA guys, the downtown guys, which I know that Sergio, um, our president, is working with Kimberly McGee on getting that worked out. So we're going we're gonna to be doing more of those things as well. Um, we are working with the Longmont Leader, which is um, kind of the replacement for the Longmont Observer, uh, to develop a news show. The Longmont Public Media is not a news entity. We are not a news entity. Brian, if you were here, I would say it to you. We're not a news entity. Uh, we are a platform for other people to create content, including news entities like the Longmont Leader. Anybody can do it. If the Times Call wanted to, they could, or a new entity, if they wanted to do it, they could do it. So working with the leader, um, a local executive producer and the Longmont Public Media, we're in essence developing a news show for Longmont that we're hoping will have high, high, high um, production values and will be very valuable to the community. Um, right now, Longmont Startup Week, you're all familiar with, it's been running for a few, few years now, but because of COVID, they were deciding whether or not to even have it, and what they decided was to go live and to do it all online. So right now, Long, Longmont Startup Week is happening um, on Channel 8 and on Longmont Startup Week's website and on our YouTube channel. So you can tune in um, during this week, all, long, all, all week long from 9 a.m. to about 4 p.m. or 5 p.m., depending on the day. Every hour, there's a new presentation from somebody about some aspect of entrepreneurial activity, how to do startups, how to create businesses, how to run your businesses. So there's this um, big, long thing happening this week that's really being enabled um, by the Walmart Startup Week people and by the technology behind what LPM is doing. And those, those also, each of those shows are individual titled and will be used um, in the future for rebroadcast. So it's a great way of creating content that's Walmart specific and focused on entrepreneurship and starting businesses. 
We have a show called The Savvy Entrepreneur, which is a, a local entrepreneur who interviews entrepreneurs. Uh, he, his latest show actually was, uh, was with Brad Feld. Brad Feld is a, a billionaire venture capitalist out of Boulder who um, is kind of world famous for, for funding um, smaller startups, you know, earlier stage startups. And he actually lives in the Longmont zip code and um, is aware of what we're doing. So I did ask him for money at one point, but I haven't heard back. So we'll see <laughs> whether or not he wants to sponsor. We're working with the League of Women Voters. Um, uh, we did the county commissioner debates. We're going to be doing more debates with the league uh, as the election gets closer. Uh, we do a broadcast Longmont exercise classes every morning, as well as Longmont story time every morning, which is stuff put on by the local library, by the, uh, by the public library here. They do readings and we take those and broadcast those about the time kids get up. So the parents can, well, you know how that works. So, <laughs> um, We also um, have a weekly weather show, which I touched base on before with John, but he also does a show called the Sky Over Longmont, where he does a monthly show on the stars above Longmont on that given month. So in July, um, this is what the stars look like, how they're aligned and what you can see and what you should be looking for that's cool. And uh, he goes through and shows star charts and shows you how to find those things with your telescope. And that is done every month. We play that at least weekly. Uh, we do do some uh, political stuff, but not us. It's other people's stuff. We're just the platform like Capital Conversations. Marsha Martin, who I believe is sitting there with you, um, does interviews of state level lawmakers as well as local and uh, county lawmakers uh, when, when the uh, state um, legislature is in session. Also, the backstory started as a podcast during the Longmont Observer days with Tim Waters and has turned into a television show and uh, is being worked out now what that's going to look, look like in the, uh, the months ahead. Also, a show called Voices and Visions, uh, which is um, discussion about people's hopes and dreams. Uh, the first season of Voice and, Voices and Visions was um, Tim Waters talking with about 70 or 75 people. Uh, Tim, correct me if I'm wrong, um, in Longmont about their feelings about where their lives were at with COVID, um, you know, with uh, three questions, which came up with some really interesting trends that he had uh, found, and you'll hear more about that in the future. Uh, we do a show uh, with Shaquille Dalal called Values, which is being produced into a live call-in show, and we're figuring out the technology for how to do that now. Uh, we're just starting a kind of a really unique thing, community conversations. This is the Longmont um, Chamber of Commerce, uh, long, along with the Longmont Leader and Longmont Public Media all together, working together to create a show about conversations that are important to the community. And um, you would not expect the Chamber to be involved with these kinds of things, but they are very um, socially conscious about how these kinds of subjects affect local businesses. So that was very interesting. And the Longmont Leader is obviously interested in uh, any kind of local news and information and helping to promote that. Uh, we, our job is to create the platform for that. So our first show was with um, Mike Butler, and you saw a picture of it earlier, Mike Butler and Glenda Jackson, uh, talking about restorative justice and um, the chamber helped to uh, run that. Scott was one of the moderators and one of the chamber members. I forgive me, I can't remember her name right now. As well as Macy May from the the, uh, the Longmont Leader moderated that show. Uh, it's up on Channel Eight, and you can also see it on YouTube and on the um, Longmont Public Media website. Um, we are currently working with the Longmont Symphony, as you know. You guys have just talked about this. How do you have? How do you meet? How do you end up in a community space and do things like a concert, a symphony concert with 1500 members, which is what they've got, and 60 or 70 people on stage that sit right next to each other. So what we're doing right now is we're working with the symphony to figure out how they can take their next season starting in October, it's about eight shows up to 12, uh, take that virtual and create a version of the symphony. We don't know what that's gonna look like yet. We're working with Kay and, um, with the conductor um, to figure out what, what that all looks like uh, and how it could be recorded and how it could be made available to their memberships and as well as to the general public. And we're also working with them um, and with Elliot, the director, uh, to do a show where he interviews musicians and he uh, talks about music, kind of alternate every other show. He'll switch between those two things and that'll be a 30-minute show that he starts. And I believe that that's going to be in the next few weeks. That's 
uh, in process now of uh, the production is just getting started on it. So um, we have talked to the senior video club. These are the guys that used to work with the old holder of the contract. Uh, they were not very happy with us when we won this contract and were not very interested in talking to us. But about three or four months in, uh, they decided to give us some videos, which were quite good. And we played those and we have not heard from them since, primarily because we think of COVID. But we're hoping to get that restarted where you've got this group of about 25 really expert um, video makers in town that are very familiar with Longmont. We hope to get them more plugged in. The hippie report you see here, I put it here because this is public access TV. And this is a very good example of public access TV. And that's all I'm gonna say about it. Um, Strongmont downtown, uh, I just saw a note from uh, Kimberly McGee thanking us. Thank you, Kimberly, if you're watching or if you hear this later. I did not ask for that. I was very surprised to see it and I really appreciate it. Uh, where we did 40, I think it's 45, 42 or 45 videos, 30 second videos about Longmont businesses downtown with their owners and what their business is and the fact that they're open for business. And we are showing those videos on channel eight and 880 between every show for the, all the entire month of July. Um, and those are also given to LDDA and to the business owners to use as they see fit. So they'll use them on Facebook for ads, um, for, you know, on uh, Twitter accounts, you know, 30 second commercial you can put just about anywhere. And it's really a quick little promo about, um, the fact that they're there and it's, you know, everybody seems to really like them. So uh, did that. We also are doing some stuff at the state level like Colorado Connections, which is a statewide show that is put together out of Denver. The latest show is, you should check it out. It is a fairly long discussion with Governor Polis about COVID and how it's affecting Colorado and where he wants to take it. And it's fairly recent, I think about a week, week old. But as Eugene was saying, who knows, everything changes so fast in that area. We also have live from Red Rocks shows, although those are not obviously current. They aren't having shows at Red Rocks, but we have shows like that that we play, uh, part of our content. Uh, we have about 100 hours of Colorado Parks and Wildlife video, everything from um, information about parks, about uh, art shows and community, a lot of outside stuff, hunting, fishing, uh, all the different things that are going on in Colorado. There's a ton of content from the Colorado Parks and Wildlife and they have a professional video production house that is in-house with them. It makes some great stuff and we play that re uh, pretty regularly. Same thing with the Denver Zoo. Uh, lots of Denver Zoo videos. Some of them are kind of corny. Some of them are really good, uh, but they're all worth watching. We also have a national news show, uh, Democracy Now!, which is kind of, uh, kind of like um, PBS, a little farther to the left, but... Um, it is a uh, daily news show, Monday through Friday, and we play it every day from 11 uh, a.m. to noon and from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. And we have a show called The Folklorist, which is an Emmy award-winning show. It was produced for a public access station back on the East Coast. It, uh, it's about, I think, three seasons or four seasons worth of shows, and it's basically stories about America and all the way from the beginning of America up to today and all these interesting things that have happened. And as I said, they've won several Emmys with it and it's really quite interesting. And we also have about uh, 50 or so hours of National Science Foundation shows, which talks about the kinds of cool science and STEM and things that are going on in America and things that they fund, as well as the things that they see happening in universities and schools and in business. So a uh, great show about technology in general. There's also other shows that we're working on, but this gives you a kind of a depth and breadth idea of uh, the kind of stuff that we do. Next slide, please. So um, as you know, we did attract uh, the um, Longmont leader, I believe. And again, another, another note that went out to city council from uh, Mandy Jenkins. I wanna thank Mandy if you're watching. Uh, we did not ask her for this. She just uh, sent this to you guys saying effectively what I say here, which is um, it is a local uh, experimental newsroom. They're trying to figure out a way to create sustainable local news in communities around the country. They started in Youngstown, Ohio last year in October, I believe they opened their first newsroom there. And Longmont um, is where they opened their second one. And they're funded by Google and they're run by McClatchy, the second largest newspaper uh, company in the United States. Um, and they're looking for a third one now, but they haven't picked it. These newsrooms were specifically designed to uh, be different than a standard newsroom. They are designed to work with the community 
And what they've told us is one of the reasons they picked Longmont was because Longmont Public Media was there and they would be able to partner with us in terms of using the space because we're a, banker, a maker space and that we have corporate memberships. So a corporation can pay a hundred bucks a month and use the building for meetings, use the studios and equipment to create media. And these guys are a, they're a news entity. So they, they need media. Uh, they don't do a lot with video, but they want to learn. So perfect fit for them there. And um, they uh, are going to also, next bullet is uh, work with us to create a new show, as I said. So that's in development right now. And again, we don't do news, but we're happy to, to create the platforms for other people to do it. And this is a perfect example of that happening. So we also provide videography services to the city. Uh, we are contracted for up to 20 hours per week. And we meet every Monday at 11 a.m. with Marika Unger and her communications team uh, in a production meeting to go over priorities for the city. So if things like uh, public service announcements or um, an example would be the, the police tribute uh, to fallen officers uh, done a month or two ago. Um, these, the live um, uh, Longmont Museum uh, concerts that we're doing right now are good. Are all good examples of the kind of video that we can do. We even do things inside of the city. If you've got a, a meeting that Sandy's, for instance, giving to a bunch of employees that they want to have other employees see, we will come and record those and make that available so you can make it more widely available to all employees, stuff like that. We also have been consulting on the city um, for the council, city council chamber rebuild, primarily the AV stuff. I don't, I, I'm not going to, promise anything, but I'm hoping that we uh, addressed many of the issues around the, the um, mic system and that it will work better. The video has been uh, reworked uh, to be easier to operate and get better views of you guys. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the chamber yet, but it's really quite beautiful. They did a wonderful job there. Um, we also have um, done something that's directly affects you guys. As you know, we said we were going to start a, a board, an advisory board. Uh, and we had started that in February and we were just reaching out to the community and getting people plugged in and starting to figure out who we wanted to be on this board and COVID hit. Um, so we are starting that up again and are going to have our first meeting uh, before the end of August. And um, well, we'll talk more about that in just a sec uh, and how that affects the city council. We do want one of you to be on that advisory board. And we are doing all of this right now for $424.65 a day which works out to $17.69 an hour. That's a little bit more than you pay a uh, minimum wage for a city employee. And that's because we run 24 seven and that's what you pay us to run this thing. So I'd say you're getting a pretty good deal. At least that's uh, how it looks to us. Um, we're doing the best we can with not a whole lot. Uh, and because the, me the media maker space kind of didn't happen, we were hoping to have a lot more help, but we're doing, we're doing okay. Next slide, please. So these are some numbers. <clears throat> we um, started from zero. Uh, as you know, the longmontchannel.org was the old uh, contract holders website that they'd run for 20 years. Um, and they would not forward that to us or give us any access to it whatsoever. Uh, by what we can tell, it's effectively shut down, which was a shame because people knew it was there. So we started from zero uh, with longmontpublicmedia.org. We broadcast 24 hours a day, seven days a week on channel 8, 880, as well as on our website, as well as on YouTube, uh, and as well as on uh, what's called T-Vision, T-Mobile's uh, Comcast competitor. So we actually send it out to four channels 24 seven currently. Uh, we do, as we've talked about, do separate live streams, um, like to YouTube and to Facebook, uh, things like the summer concert series, a bunch of other stuff in, in the works. Um, we have on-demand, uh, versions of every video we've made. And an important note about these numbers is that um, Comcast and T-Vision are not in these numbers. Comcast will not tell us who's watching. Um, and we, we work on a regular basis to try to get them to. They just flat out won't do it. Their answer is, hey, it's not in our contract with the city. We don't have to. So, you know, toss off. And they just won't give it to us. So if you take a look at these numbers, um, the page views, these are cumulative. We've had about 21,000 uh, page views over the last six months. We've had about 7,000 people actually interact with the website and about 5,000 unique uh, IP addresses uh, interacting with our website. 
And if you look down below in terms of social media, this is actually how you, we tend to reach people. Our videos are up on social media on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. We've had about 100,000 people look at um, our content and we've had about 50,000 people in Longmont, unique IPs in Longmont, uh, look at our content on social media. So we are getting out there. Um, it, I would like to get a lot farther out there and I'd like to get a lot more people to understand that we have a website and that all of that's there, but that takes time. We've been around six months. Next slide, please. So challenges and risks, um, as you know, COVID-19 has kind of stopped everything in its tracks. Uh, maker spaces um, are, uh, and co-working spaces have pretty much had their business model ripped out from under them. People don't want to congregate in spaces. So uh, I'll give you an example, Tinker Mill had 800 members. Uh, at one point, it's down to about 600 now. That not, that's not all COVID related, but a big chunk of it was COVID related that has since leveled out and is starting to climb back up again, but it really was a hit. And uh, we never had that luxury of having a large user base uh, in place already. We started at zero and we had just started to take off when COVID hit and that just, it just knocked us dead. And the problem with that is that was our plan for replacing the revenue that um, was that's slowly dropping off and now more quickly dropping off from the franchise fees that pay for uh, public media. So without having a makerspace uh, membership base to help fund what we're doing, uh, it means that uh, we are not able to do as much as we had hoped we would be able to do. Which takes us to franchise fees. As you know, we're allocated 25% of the franchise fees that come into the city. Uh, and these are the fees that uh, it's about a four and a half percent, five percent fee on video services, not internet or phone that Comcast provides only video. And um, Q1, Comcast lost 400,000 uh, video subscribers nationally. This is the largest single quarterly drop they've ever had. And that was pre-pandemic. And as you know, in the pandemic, people lost their jobs. They um, are worried about, about um, uh, having enough money to pay rent and a lot of people to pay food. So we're expecting to see an even more severe drop uh, in that in Q2 and on. So that will directly impact the franchise fees used to pay for Longmont public media and other public media types of things. And because the next last bullet is we have less community content than we'd planned on because we don't have a makerspace. The makerspace, the plan was to have the makerspace and all those people with all their great ideas and all of their energy and enthusiasm uh, to create these shows isn't there. So we haven't been able to make as many long, specific Longmont focused shows as we would like to. Uh, we will again, but right now it's really hard to do without the makerspace, without the members and the community in the space, it's difficult to do. Next slide. So what we would like to ask from you are a couple things. One is um, we'd like to ask that you name somebody from the council to be on our advisory board. Um, and that's obviously, and we're not asking for that tonight. Uh, but if you can decide who you'd like to represent the city on this board, um, uh, we will invite them as soon as you tell us uh, sometime between now and the end of August, probably mid-August is when the meeting will be somewhere in that time frame. Uh, so if you'll let us know, uh, if, if one of you want to be on that board, there's a seat waiting for you. And the second question is, considering all that I've just told you, we'd like you to uh, think about the potential of changing the deliverables for 2021 uh, to line up with what we believe is going to be a, fa a fairly significantly decreased contract payment uh, for this contract, primarily because of the franchise fees dropping off and the lack of being able to build up a makerspace uh, that COVID is the situation that we've been put in with COVID. So, and that pretty much sums that up. Any questions? Council Member Christensen. Um. Well, I'll be happy to volunteer just as I did for the Cable Trust Board and um, so many. Um, so I have a number of questions. I, I think this is a, an excellent presentation. You laid out a number of um, problems that you have, but I, nevertheless, I think this is an incredible uh, pile of work. I don't know other <laughs> way to put it. Uh, a huge a variety. More organized than that, slightly more organized. Style, yeah, <laughs> but a, a huge variety and um, a huge leap forward in modernization and potential for um, 
uh, a lot of cross collaboration between the library, between Longmont Observer, which is not the Longmont Observer anymore, it's Longmont Leader, um, the museum. I mean, it, and the fact that you're videotaping or, well, you were videotaping and now you're using Zoom meetings. Mm -hmm. All the plan, I mean, it's just an amazing amount of variety that you have done and added to this city. And I, I'm very grateful to you because this right. is this modernization is exactly what we needed. And much as I'm fond of the cable guys, and I am, I, they're nice guys, but uh, we really needed to take a fresh look at everything and move into this century. And that really wasn't happening fast enough or maybe at all, but. <laughs> Um, so I, I'm very grateful to you, and I, I think we do need to discuss, uh, you, and you've also done this during COVID, which is like a totally um, impossible situation for everybody, but you've been enormously flexible in being able to reuse the uh, work on the uh, meetings at the library, switch from um, videotaping everything to doing Zoom meetings, to having translations or uh, transcriptions rather. All these things are really gonna be very helpful in the long run to this city. And so I, I thank you for doing that. Um, I do think we need to figure out some way to be more helpful because cable isn't Comcast in my point of view. And I think most other people's point of view is not gonna start adding people back again. It's, yeah, so we know that. And the maker space will come back and I think we'll get more people content. We need to advertise this uh, more vigorously so that people know the difference between, I don't think a lot of people uh, understand the difference between a maker space member and uh, just a member of the public. Any member of the public can come speak because that's why, or come produce work. That's why it's called Longmont Public Media. And that's a very old tradition in, or, well, old enough <laughs> uh, tradition in, um, in the United States and a very, very good tradition. But people also can get uh, extra perks and extra access with makerspace and have more opportunities. But p if people understood that they anybody can do this, anybody can come and produce content and have it aired, it has to be worthwhile, but you know, there's a not lot always, of latitude. Not always, <laughs> but yeah. Doesn't it? <laughs> well, sometimes you, you have to put up with people you know, some things should probably not be put up, but they are part of the public voice. Yeah, that's right. And that's a good thing. That's what public media is. It's like, um, so I do think we need to have a discussion about what we can do to be helpful to keep this going because you guys have really been um, working at a huge disadvantage. I, I mean, everybody right now is working at a huge disadvantage, but you've nevertheless produced a whole lot of stuff that's good for this town. So I would like us to discuss in the future pretty soon, uh, some way that we can be helpful to you. So that's all I have to say, except we already did discuss this about, you know, who we were gonna have for the cable trust and, um, Councilwoman Peck and I were interested and then that got eliminated and so I'm still interested. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Sandy, I was just wondering, this would be stuff that would generally come up when the contract is up for renewal, is that correct? Actually, Mayor Pro Tem, I believe that Scott is asking for that advisory board member anytime, not necessarily as part of the contract. And we are not planning to bring you back that decision about the contract tonight. Tonight was really a presentation from Scott. I did send you all survey results from our public engagement that Council Member Peck asked for when we did sign the contract. And so our intention is to bring it back in a month or so. Um, but if you had some specific direction you'd like for us to pursue tonight, that would be that would be great to hear. Otherwise, we'll work with Longmont Public Media and bring you back a contract later in the year. Uh, Councilmember Waters. 
I think um, I think the, when we weigh in, not when there's a contract negotiation, we would weigh in. I think this is what Councilmember Christensen was suggesting as we build budgets. Um, the 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 source of funding we know are the camp uh, the cable franchise fees, uh, based on Scott's uh, presentation, and we talked about this a year ago. Yeah, that continues to decline. And if we're going to maintain the 25% of, of total, total franchise fees, then, then that revenue stream is going to decline. So in his presentation, it was, it was to renegotiate deliverables. And I'm not certain that we want to do that in this setting. But I would be curious if, if we don't do anything in terms of budgeting and revenues, cable franchise fees decline, if Scott's prepared to, to talk about what deliverables from his perspective would drop off, so we would, we would have an idea about that when it comes to our review of budget proposals. And, um, and at some point in that context as well, if there were if, what you would buy for additional levels of or commitments of funding, at X would, would result in some package of deliverables uh, beyond what we've seen this year, uh, which is pretty ambitious. But, but I do think it's a, it's a budgeting question First, and then it's a renegotiation of deliverables if, if there isn't going to be additional consideration or what we would get if there is. So to the degree that that's a question, Scott, you can respond to it. I don't know. I think the negotiation of deliverables ultimately is going to be between Sandy and Scott. That's not for us to do. But, but to have an idea of what we give up if, if, there's, no, if there's not another budget dollar committed to it other than 25% of franchise fees or what we get if we wanted to make a bigger investment? Well, um, I'm not really prepared to say what we would cut right now, um, but I can say that as this drops, the we actually have hit pretty much all of our deliverables so far. I mean, it's uh, surprising to me that we, I mean, if you look at the list of stuff, the things that we couldn't do, for instance, were high school sports because no high school sports, right? So, you know, things like that. Um, we haven't done as much um, arts and entertainment stuff, but we've done, you know, a fair amount um, and we have a bunch in the works. So the reality is there pretty much, you could make the argument that we are kind of hitting most of our deliverables, even though we are working without effectively the volunteer staff we assumed would be there. Um, that said, there's no way that that's right now we've got five people. We've got Sergio Angelis, who's our business development guy. We've got Craig Stevens, who is our executive producer. Devin Hindorf, who is the makerspace manager as well as a producer, uh, videographer, and myself. And that's it. Um, and we are doing pretty much all of the work right now. Um, Tim is doing a show. Shaquille's doing a show. The, you know, there's a series of people that are working on stuff and we help them. Um, but I'm not sure that right now we're all working for about minimum wage, including myself. Um, yeah, I'm talking city minimum wage. So, uh, so between 15 and $17 an hour is what we, what the five of us make in that area. And that's because we love what we're doing, but I can tell you that that's not sustainable long-term. That's a bunch of people who said, we love this. We want it to happen. And we're willing to give it a year to see what we can do. Um, I'm going to probably by the end of the year have to lower the number of people that are in this, this organization. You also can't have somebody like me um, and pay, pay them because I'm not going to be, I'm an old guy. I'm not going to be around that long. Um, you're going to have to find somebody to run this thing and you're going to have to pay them enough to, you know, to be able to live on. I mean, I can live on very little because uh, I own my house and I own my car and all that stuff. So, but that's not true with most people. So I would say that you would probably see things like the boards and commissions drop off. Um, you would see less shows. You'd see um, not as much access to the space uh, because we wouldn't be able to keep it clean. We wouldn't be able to monitor it like we, we, we would need to. So it would probably drop down to two or three people that were working there because we're headed towards the, you know, this, when we, when we first came in, we said it's $185,000 to do all this. And you guys came back with, well, well what can you do for $165,000? We said, no, we can do most of it. You know, pretty much all of it. We just will have to work harder. And we signed the contract and then we got a notice from the city saying, well, actually it's $155,000. And 
that is dependent on whatever we get from Comcast, whatever the city gets from Comcast. So I don't even know if it's going to be that by the end of the year. It could be 140,000. We don't know. We don't, re don't really know because we don't know what's happening with Comcast. So you can expect less and you can expect it to look more like the old Channel 8 if you don't do anything. That's where, you're, that's where eventually it'll head. Um, if you were to give a larger percentage, and I, I've made this argument before, and Sandy, please forgive me. I'm, I know you don't like this argument, but um, <clears throat> the idea behind the franchise fees when they first were created was to fund public ac a platform for public access television and for the community and the people in the community to have a place to have a voice. It was a platform for community voice. And the full amount of the franchise fee was intended for this kind of thing. What happened was they didn't put enough in the law to say that it must be that way. And cities started going, oh, we can take, because uh, it was big money in New York. It was hundreds of millions of dollars in franchise fees. And they were, you don't need that much money to do public access, which at the time was true. Um, we'll take this much of it and use it on other stuff for the city that's good. And there was a time when that made sense because there was a lot of that franchise fee money. But now that these numbers are dropping, it's getting to the point where the, the, the actual intent of what that fee was for um, is now being starved out of existence. We are the only city outside of Aspen in Colorado that has a separate public access TV entity. Every other city in the state has taken it in, into the city itself as a video group and generally spends more money than substantially more money than what you're spending on us. The city of Fort Collins, for instance, has five employees being making city of Fort Collins wages uh, and all the equipment and stuff that goes with that. They are looking at about four to $500,000 a year is what they spend on video stuff for the same, actually quite a bit less than what you're getting from us right now, if you look at it, which we did. So, so some of the things you could expect from us, if you, if you um, were to add more, would be more original programming. Um, we would be able to add more people to, to make more original programming available, things like documentaries on Longmont, um, which I would love to do. Um, a big and important one is something I touched on is staff retention, um, being able to, you know, fair market pay, pay at least, you know, close to it. Um, channel expansion. As you know, we have four channels, actually. We have channel 8 and 880, um, which we basically send the same signal to, but we could send two different signals to it and have two, two channels there. And also channel 14, which is educational, and channel 16, which is government. Currently, Channel 14 is a guy named George Dereso, I'm sorry, George um, Bascos, uh, who runs K Good Radio. He has a little computer down in his office, and he plays, he, <laughs> he plays pictures of birds. That's what's on Channel 14, uh, and we have no control over it. Uh, he controls that system. Channel 16 is um, run by a similar system at the city of Longmont. It's a, it's a fiber cable channel from the city, the Civic Center to the Comcast head end. And a woman there puts up those cards that you see in the TVs around the Civic Center, you know, like um, jobs, postings, you know, different types of stuff that's going on in Longmont. Both of those channels could be full blown TV channels, you know, like a full blown government channel where we put the city council meetings and we play them all, you know, 24 seven and along with all the boards and commissions. So you got a place where real government transparency and information lives. We could take channel 14, and I have offered this to the St. Rain Valley School District, um, to have their own channel. They have a television studio at the Innovation Center, a full-blown green screen, you know, 800 square foot television studio that costs probably $250,000, $300,000 to build. It's amazing. They could easily run a, 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 a cable channel with tons of content. They create tons of video now. They just keep it all inside. So things like that, we could work with um, different organizations to make those things happen and really make the media landscape in Longmont rich, far richer than anything that Boulder and any of the guys around us do. And I know you guys have been talking about attracting businesses. You want to attract business? Make your media landscape rich. Make it so that we can go out and we can take entertainment venues and put them on TV and put them on the internet to get more people to realize what's going on in Longmont. Media is the key to this stuff and this it's dying. Local media is dying. So if you don't invest in it, it'll be dead. We will be dead in two years, maybe three. Public Sandy? access will be gone. Pardon? Sorry, it's trying to, 
Um, Sandy's had her hand up. Oh, sorry. Should I be quiet? Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Sandy Cedar, Assistant City Manager. Um, I, I just want to clarify a couple things that Scott said. Um, so one, franchise fees are actually created because of the right of way that cable companies at the time used of city right of way. So they paid us for that right of way because it is actually public land and that's what creates franchise fees. That's why they are created. They weren't created for public access. Um, although they're used often for public access as Scott has mentioned, there is a secondary source which is called a PEG fee, public educational government channel fee which can be used for equipment. That's 100% um, given to Longmont Public Media in this particular case, because it's, that is the section that is completely dedicated towards public access. So I just wanted to clear that up a little bit. The other piece of it is that our franchise fee as a whole is one of the revenues that we use in order to provide all kinds of city services. So everything from your public safety officers to librarians to um, other folks in the general fund. And so when Scott and I have talked about this, I know he has talked about, could we have more of the franchise fee? But as you all know, we're not exactly in the best budget situation this year. So my suggestion was that we work through the contract instead. So um, at the same time, if y'all wanted to do, you know, some different way of looking at it, you know, we could certainly talk about it, but I wanted to just point out that the franchise fees actually are for the use of the right of way and that PEG fees are used for public access of which I'm a public media gets 100% of. One, one note on the PEG fees is that they are for things, not people. It's for capital only. We can't pay people with them. Yes, that's exactly right, which is, I think, why um, in Longmont's case, we do have a portion of the franchise fee as part of our financial policies going towards cable access, because you're right, the PEG fee can go towards the stuff, but not the people. It's a capital a capital fee, basically. So, so just to quickly run through the last of it, um, we would use money, additional money for licensing of music programming. Uh, we would use it for remote studios. Mm -hmm. We've talked to J uh, Justin about putting cameras up in the Longmont Museum, like you guys have in the city council chambers. And we could very easily do, and we can do the same thing at the library uh, and make it so we have remote studios uh, in different city facilities and other facilities, if you thought it was interesting would not cost that much, um, but it would you know, cost some money and it would give a huge uh, advantage. We would also do more community outreach and inclusion, um, more marketing, more engaging of groups. And we would work a lot closer than we already are with the city communications folks with bulletins and doing videos and augmenting city communications. So there's a whole bunch of areas that we could do more if we had more uh, budget. But to Sandy's point, I totally get it. Um, you and I are going to have to agree to disagree on this point, though, because I did do the research into the laws and uh, the intent 40 years ago was what I described. You're absolutely right that what happens today is that it is set up as a contract based on access, like you said. So, Councilmember Barton. I was, uh, forgot I had my hand up. Um, I actually just wanted to um, give kind of a shout out to the members who have hung on. Um, the level of enthusiasm and creativity in the small group who calls into the member meeting every week is just amazing. Um, the people who are working uh, for Longmont Public Media started out as members and fell in love and their enthusiasm is amazing. Um, you know, I might ask for some technical support and get an offer of help and I'll say, no, 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 you know, you're, you work for LPM. And I've gotten the answer, well, I'm a member too. I wanna help you. So um, I still say no because I want LPM to come first, but it's just an ama you know, amazing amount of loyalty among the core, um, employees and volunteers. And I just think that that, that needs to be um, noted, uh, honored. Um, I'm tremendously grateful for it. And I enjoy uh, honestly being part of it, even though um, I don't produce nearly amount, the amount of content that, uh, for example, uh, Dr. Waters or Shaquille um, or, or uh, John the weatherman does. Um, they are amazing how they get so much produced. Um, but uh, I do want to note that 
that meeting, that weekly meeting, which is on Wednesday night, and you can find it from the website, is a public meeting. So anybody at all who's curious to learn more can drop in. Um, the Zoom link is on the website. Don't all drop in at once, because I don't know, there's some Zoom limitation, you know. But uh, if anybody's, Scott wants to say something. Scott's muted. I just said it's 100 people. You could have up to 100 people. So please do come. So. Council Member Peck. I just wanted to thank Scott and uh, Sandy. And I'm looking forward to Sandy bringing back this information during our budget process. So whatever you, you put your heads together, what you need. And until then, I can't wait to hear what you have to bring back to us. So thank you. Thank you. Council Member Christensen. Um, Scott, I think it would be useful for you to explain the relationship between McClatchy, and, which apparently just went through, well, apparently actually just went through bankruptcy and um, was sold uh, 100, after 163 years to Chatham Assets um, and Google and the Observer and Longmont Public Media. And um, also what efforts have, uh, I, I realize you guys are small staff, but what efforts you've made to trying to get grants for, um, for this entity, uh, you know, for Longmont Public Media? Can you hear me now? There we go. Um, so McClatchy, as you said, was purchased by a hedge fund. Uh, the good news is it wasn't a, the bad hedge fund. The bad hedge fund that owns uh, like the Times Call and the Denver Post and then is known for uh, ripping out the hearts of local media uh, bid on this, but lost. Um, so that's the good news. This is a hedge fund that actually does give a, does care about news. So McClatchy is intact. Uh, it is um, still a healthy company from the perspective of uh, having funding now from the hedge fund. They uh, are still operating all of their newspapers. I believe it's 37 newspapers. Some of them, you know, many of them are major Pulitzer Prize winning entities. Um, the uh, Mandy Jenkins, who runs this for the uh, McClatchy folks, uh, is in New York City, and she has been in, she's, uh, I think, in her early 40s, and she's been doing this since she was in high school. She's been doing local news, so she's extremely well um, versed in how to do this. Macy May ran the Longmont Observer for us, uh, and she now is running the Longmont Leader, along with a staff of four people, two or three reporters, and a business development person and another editor reporter. So um, that entity is its own standalone entity, the, the McClatchy entity, the Longmont leader. Google funds it uh, to the tune of, I believe, I don't know these numbers for sure, but I'm guessing around a quarter million dollars a year for the next two years. And uh, their goal is to, at the end of that two years, figure out, do you shut this down or do we have a sustainable model? And they're trying all kinds of different things. Um, their relationship with us is purely a makerspace relationship. Just as if, if you were a member at Tinkermill, this would be, it's the exact same relationship as you as a member at Tinkermill would have. There is no tie to us other than they pay us hundred bucks a month to be a member. They have access to the building, access to the tools, and they can ask staff questions, you know, how to run things. Uh, we have nothing to do with their contents. We have nothing to do with anything that they produce. Um, they do all of that. The Longmont Observer uh, is actually what owns Longmont Public Media. It is uh, a uh, 501c3 corporation that uh, myself, Macy May, and Sergio Angelis are, the, are the, um, the officers of. And then we have three more or four more people that are on the board. That's all going to change here in the next month or two. Uh, we are going to change Longmont Observer to Longmont Public Media and change the mission from creating unbiased local news to creating local public media. So the mission will change, the entity will change, the name will change, uh, Longmont, public, uh, Longmont Observer goes away uh, completely. 
So there, the, the relationship there is, there isn't one with the Hallmark Observer. So what was the fourth one? There was one other piece. Um, I, I see, you see why it's confusing to most people. They don't, yeah, they don't get that. Um, <laughs> but the other piece is uh, what efforts have, uh, has Longmont Public Media made to find grants uh, ah. and things like that. I know grants are hard. They it are takes hard. It forever to write them. It takes, it, it, it's hard to get them. But, but they're know. important. They're really important. And we have, so Sergio um, was our CTO and now he is our business development guy. And because of his work with LEDP and the Innovate uh, project, um, he is very well versed in talking to different organizations and he is point on grants with us. We have a grant committee, which is made up of a guy named Anthony Main, who is on our board and has written and won grants before. Shaquille Dalal, who you've heard from. Um, uh, Sergio drives that. Ron Thomas from Tinkermill is part of that. He's also a member at, at uh, Longmont Public Media. And we are talking to Ron uh, about doing stuff with Tinkermill uh, to create joint grants right now. We think we have a better chance of getting grants if we're doing particularly education and how-to and uh, grants that, that are much easier to explain to, to, um, to uh, foundations and have a distinct specific thing they get at the end because that's what they really want. Uh, so we've, when you talk about public media, it, it can be kind of ethereal. You know, and, unless you can show something very specific. So we're going to start with stuff we really know, which is Tinkermill and what Tinkermill can do. And it's got, you know, hundreds of people that know how to do all kinds of amazing things. And Lama Public Media, which knows how to produce that stuff. And together, we're going to find uh, a series of potential donors and start that process. We actually started that process about three weeks ago to really dig into it. So I'm hoping to see some results in the next few months. Uh, we also are working with the community found the Boulder Community Foundation, um, Boulder County Community Foundation, uh, having those discussions as well. So we are very much aware of grants. We see there there being five revenue sources, which is membership fees um, from Makerspace, uh, the contract with the city, um, sponsorships, potentially advertising, uh, grants, uh, sponsorships and advertising are the same thing. Grants and then. Um, pro services, professional services. So if somebody wants us to produce videos for them and uh, it's not a maker, it's like a company that like the Subaru dealership in town wants us to do an ad. We can do those things, We can, but we charge for that. So that's how we make, that's how we plan on making money. If COVID would go away, we'd be doing great. <laughs> we really would, I think we would. Well, and if you could get a, um, a cooperative uh, agreement with the school system, that could bring in some money too. That would be awesome, but you Good know- luck with that though. <laughs> you know our school system, yeah. They're great. I mean, we have an amazing school system. I mean, they really are. They do amazing stuff, but they are not, you know, working with outside organizations is difficult for them. Largely because you got these kids to worry about. So I get it. I understand what they're worried about, but it's hard. It's very hard. All right, thank you. I don't see any other questions. All right, so thank, uh, you. thank you, Scott. Thank you, all of you. Take care. Do we need a break or is everybody good to go on? Or we do want a break? Really quick, can I get a break? Yes, let's, let's take I'm a five minute break. <laughs> I think Polly's probably close by. Thought I saw her. Yeah, there she is. All right, if everybody's ready, I think we can move along to item 6B, sales and use tax simplification code changes. All right, Mayor Pro Tem, I'm Jim Golden. I'm the city's chief financial officer. And uh, I'll be making this presentation tonight, but I've also got, had a couple of staff members who will also be here to help assist or answer questions. Uh, Richard Eastis is our sales tax administrator. 
and Jamie Roth is the assistant city attorney for the city. And they've been working hands-on on this project. So we will be bringing to you in a regular meeting in August, uh, some action items, uh, an ordinance or two, and an intergovernmental agreement related to this. And this is all about sales and use tax simplification efforts. So I'm gonna to try to give you a sort of a summary presentation so that you have some background before you see these items on your agenda next month and also give you all an opportunity to maybe ask some questions if you have any currently. So uh, this has been an issue in Colorado for uh, a number of years on, on uh, sales and use tax simplification. Uh, what we've got that we'll be bringing to you are a few items to address it. Uh, to, uh, uh, one would be uh, a model ordinance that's been put together that by the CML and home rule cities in the, in the state that will include standardized definitions. And those are gonna be key in, in the next stage of what we're gonna be doing with an IGA between the city and the state for the use of an online portal for businesses to, to file and remit returns and payments and also to access a GIS location database for out-of-state businesses. So these, these are gonna be critical efforts to make it easier for businesses who are outside the state to, to do business within uh, the state of Colorado, and of course with the city of Longmont. And um, they, they will hopefully eventually lead to the city receiving more sales tax from out-of-state retailers. Uh, the background going back about three years ago. Um, well, first of all, I should point out that there, there is a number of home rule cities in Colorado and, and there are 72 of them that have their own, their own they self collect their sales tax. And so they can also have their own sales tax bases. And that's what presents a challenge for businesses doing business in the state of Colorado because they have to report to 72 different entities they may have different bases, different tax rates. And if you're set from outside the state, you're probably not familiar with those. And so that's been a barrier for us to be able to try to be involved in any internet sales tax uh, collection. So a few years ago, the state decided to put together a, a task force to address the sales tax simplification to move the state of Colorado towards a position to make it easier for businesses to do business with, uh, with cities in Colorado. So this task force uh, did work and put together some uh, standardized definitions and Longmont was involved in that. And we did implement those standardized definitions about three years ago. And then about two years ago, uh, the uh, US Supreme Court I uh, had a decision in the case of South Dakota versus Wayfair. And in that case, uh, South Dakota had enacted a, a statute regarding internet sellers and th that don't have a physical presence within their state. And they were trying to get them to collect and remit sales tax. Uh, that was not allowed under, under prior Supreme Court rulings, but uh, the Supreme Court overturned those rulings two years ago and they held that out-of-state sellers' physical presence in the taxing state wasn't necessary for the state to require a seller to collect and remit its sales tax. So South Dakota showed uh, they had things in place that made it that it was allowable under, by the Supreme Court. They were able to show that they were not putting an undue burden on interstate commerce. Uh, so what they did is they had a threshold that if you didn't have if you had sales below a certain threshold, then you didn't have to remit. And they also have a single state level uh, tax level administration, and then they created uniform definitions. So, um, so what we've the uh, state of Colorado Colorado has been trying to do in the last couple of years is to put similar things in place as well. Uh, the state did uh, pass a, a sourcing rule in late 2018 which essentially addressed where a sale occurs. Uh, and a caveat to that rule is that the filing and collection of the tax can't take place again, unless uh, if, if an undue burden is, is put on interstate commerce. Uh, so what happened is we didn't, we the cities, the home rule cities in Colorado, including Longmont, did nothing uh, to um, uh, get out of state businesses 
to apply or collect and remit taxes uh, as a result of Wayfair. Uh, we didn't want to act on that and the state uh, through CML, the, the cities in the state all acted uniformly and not doing so. Instead, that they, what they're moving toward was creating that sort of an interstate portable portal for the collection of those taxes and um, also the, the standardized definitions. So um, the task force, uh, they, they uh, moved forward and put out RFPs to try to, to get uh, a software for that interstate portal connection and also for GIS uh, a database for able to, to do address locators. All of that was um, identified uh, late last year, early this year. And, and so those have moved into place. This, uh, this, uh, the cities got together with CML and they created a, this model ordinance with more standardized definitions uh, that are relevant to uh, these out-of-state sellers that would be uh, need to be adopted. So um, we're in a position now to move to put all of those into place. Um, I wanted to kind of curve off in a little parallel direction in that a couple of years ago, the city uh, did budget dollars towards a replacement of our own sales and use tax system. We've uh, had our own in-house systems and in-house built system for uh, 35, 40 years. And it obviously doesn't have very good functionality. And so uh, we have limited reporting capabilities. And so uh, we've been moving towards replacing that. But knowing what was going on at the state level, we put that on hold until the uh, decision was made at the state level about the, um, the, the portal that would be available. And, to, and so what we did is once that decision was made, we were able to piggyback on the state's uh, contract to be able to select the same software provider who was going to provide that portal to use as well as for our own sales and use tax system. So uh, part of, of what we're bringing forward uh, in a couple of weeks are um, amendments to the code that will address our uh, licensing requirements. So we currently are, um, we, we require uh, any business doing any uh, business doing business in the city of Longmont to have the retail uh, sales tax license. So we have contractors who have been required to uh, file um, file an application for a license with us, and they do most of their business. Uh, they're building contractors, and so when the only sales tax collections or uh, payments that they make they are making when they are pulling building permits. So they're really not remitting any sales tax to, to us in our sales tax system. They're also licensed elsewhere under the code as contractors, <coughs> excuse me. So what we're proposing to do is to exempt them from the, the business license requirement because part of the, uh, the cost for our new software system is driven based on the number of licenses we have. So we're trying to purge the licenses that really are not producing any sales tax for us anymore. And <clears throat> even though these, the, they're still in business, we can still get their sales tax through the building permit system. So it, it's also kind of a simplification for them that they don't have to license with the city twice. So that would be uh, the second part of, of this um, change. <clears throat> so the ordinance, or two that you may see in a couple of weeks are standardized definitions addressing the, the marketplace sellers and then the change in the, the licensing requirement as well. And then the IGA is an IGA between the city and the state to, to use their internet portal system. Uh, we, we think that this will probably have a, a positive effect on our sales tax collections we do receive a lot of, of internet sales tax already uh, from Amazon and from the large retailers in town that already have a nexus here. And so they have to collect it. And so we're receiving um, currently over, over $2 million a year of internet sales tax, but um, I'm sure there's gonna be a positive impact from this that will probably uh, generate more sales tax. And certainly from a staff efficiency perspective, 
we believe once we get this new system in place, it's going to help us with our processing of returns, certainly going to help the, the, the tax filers as well. And they'll be able to easily make electronic payments and file their returns online. And our reporting hopefully will, will also improve as well. So that's all I had. I can answer any questions you have. Council Member Peck. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I'm really happy about this Wayfair and CMLs, about being able to use a portal on the state. Uh, I've talked to you about that Wayfair decision a couple of times and why, why we couldn't move forward uh, with it. So I'm very, very happy to see the city doing this. Um, what is the timeline or do you even have one for when this ordinance uh, will go forward with CML or? So for, at, at this point, all well, CML's done what they need to do. So now it's on the city to, to um, adopt this ordinance, which we think we'll probably bring to you in the first me regular meeting in August. And so once we have that in place and the uh, IGA signed with the state, um, it's just a matter, we can, the portal will probably be available to us uh, within a month or so from then. And we'll be moving towards implementing the new sales tax system in the uh, second half of this year so that we hopefully have that in place by the end of the year. So, I mean, we, we, we could probably begin to see uh, new licensing and remitting uh, in the fourth quarter a little bit. How, just uh, out of curiosity, how does that work with, uh, because there's a lot of online sales going on right now, uh, not only with, uh, with the big departments, but the smaller ones too. Are, are the smaller uh, online services or I'm sorry, retail outlets like Nordstrom, like uh, uh, Swell, like, like any other, how does that work? How do we capture those smaller, but very active uh, retailers? You know, a lot of them have been um, coming forward on their own because they may have a, a decent amount of sales to Longmont addresses. So they have come forward and, and uh, licensed with us. And they may have also done it because they had some sort of economic nexus here in Longmont. And so they would, in that case, they would have been forced to. And just recognizing that they just come forward and, and they have uh, applied for a license and remitted to us. So uh, others, I think as we start to begin to see this internet, this, this statewide portal utilized, I think they'll see that Longmont is also uh, self-collecting. And so as they sign up with the state and they see these 72 entities, they can begin to remit very easily with one form to all 72 of those entities. Would there be any way for for transparency for uh, at least council to see who those uh, online realtors are just out of curiosity? Online retailers. Retailers. I said realtors, but I didn't mean that. Um, I don't know, Jamie, you might want to jump in here. I think I, I, as long as we're not giving the amounts, we may be able to do that. Just out of curiosity, I would be interested. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I believe that the reports are, um, that the reports from the statewide portal um, will feed into our system as well. So we'll be able to see who's making those payments. Um, and Council Member Peck, you spoke of smaller retailers. There, there is um, a threshold because Wayfair spoke about a certain sales threshold that must be met. So. We won't be capturing absolutely every single sale. Um, and that's in part because uh, the system is designed not to place a burden, an undue burden on interstate commerce. So they do have to be of a certain size to even register. But then I believe once they're paying into that statewide portal, we receive reports um, from that statewide system. So and the question was, is there any way that we could see who it was just out of curiosity? And that, or, that, my, my question, Jamie, is whether that's public information or not. I believe it would be, but I, I'll look into that, Council okay. Member Pack, and I'll follow up with you. Great. Thanks, Jamie. Council Member Christensen. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, thank you, Jim, for, uh, I, I'm very much for this. Um, 
And I think you did a very good job of explaining it. Um, I'd like to add a few things. Uh, National League of Cities has been working on this for over six years. And they were one of the main forces that helped get this through because cities, well, every, every municipality of any size needs uh, to be getting the taxes that they deserve. And um, CML has worked on this for just as long. Um, so Colorado has one of the most complicated systems of taxes, apparently, that, <laughs> that exists, which makes sense. But um, um, so the reason for this was that states were losing piles of money and um, in uh, uncollected sales tax. Um, and also the um, small businesses and brick and mortar shops were at a d huge disadvantage because they were competing against um, entities on the internet that didn't charge any sales tax. So this is, was a really important victory, uh, winning Wayfair to getting uh, a more of a level playing field for brick and mortar shops with, um, uh, with the internet. And, you know, Sears Roebuck has been uh, doing mail order delivery for uh, over a hundred years and they charge sales tax. I mean, you know, the, the, the argument that the internet people made that they couldn't possibly do this. Well, people have been doing this for, with paper and pencil for years. Um, the other thing that I really like about this is I talked to a lot, a lot of guys I know in my neighborhood are small time contractors and for various things. They have, they're supposed to be getting a license for every single city that they do work in, which costs money and it's annoying and they have to keep uh, track of reviving them. This is a, this will help them a lot. But, you know, this is one of those things like Wayfair, we won Wayfair, yay, the money will be rolling in. Well, it's very, very complicated. That's why since that decision, CML has been working on a statewide basis um, with legislators and with everybody else to, to create a statewide system and consistent definitions. And, and you and uh, Sandy, I know are really experts in this. And, but now that we have the portal and we have the definitions and we have some consistency, it should be very good in the long run for everybody. Because before that it was, the, for small businesses, it was a, impossible to be trying to send money to each of the 72 uh, zip codes and yeah. So this is, this is a huge amount of work that a lot of very dedicated people have done on a pretty, to most people, pretty boring subject, but it'll really help all the municipalities of any size um, get the sales tax that they deserve. So thank you for all your hard work on this. Uh, you bet. Now I need to point towards uh, Richard Eastis, uh, Jamie Roth as well. They're, they're the ones that did most of the work on this. I'm just presenting it to you all, but uh, Richard's been working with CML on this for years. Hi. <laughs> I don't see any other questions amongst council members. Uh, is there anything else from the staff? No, that's all. Thanks. We'll be back in a couple of or uh, three or so weeks with it. All right. Well, thank you, Richard, Jamie, and Jim. Uh, looking forward to seeing these come across because they make perfect sense to me as far as everything that you explained. And so I believe that we'll be now moving on to item 6C, the discussion to resubmit the ballot item concerning 30-year leases as a charter amendment for the November 3rd, 2020 ballot. Carol? Um, Mayor and Council, I know you all asked for this item to be placed on the agenda um, to, to have this discussion in terms of, um, is this something that you want staff to bring forward uh, in the terms of a potential ballot initiative? Uh, essentially what we did is we just took the item uh, that we presented to you all during last year um, when you put this forward, um, so you could start the discussion and advise staff uh, in terms of what you would like us to do with this item in the future. 
um, when we started looking at the meeting schedules, we knew we were running short on time. Um, and so then to bring that in a study session and then turn it around for action based on the amount of time we had, we just wanted to place it on here um, and get your policy direction. Councilmember Christensen. Um, I am very much opposed to just whimsically altering the city charter, but <laughs> I do think that, I, I don't know when this, uh, the 20 year um, restriction was put on, what year that was, but I suspect it was a long time ago. And uh, while I understand the reason for this, that city founders did not want to whimsically uh, rent out city property for a very, very long time because it, it makes it, um, it hamstrings the city on one hand, but things have changed a great deal, I think, since uh, this was put forth. And the truth is that banks really don't want to loan people something for only 20 years. They really do want to loan somebody something for 30 years. And I, I understand that too. And I understand from a business point of view, they ha it may take 20, 30 years to get their money back, you know, to earn enough to pay that back and blah, 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 and make a profit. Um, I don't have an objection to putting this on the ballot again. My objection is that if we keep putting stuff on the ballot that people have rejected, it kind of makes us look like idiots. And like, well, well, we're just gonna keep putting it on the ballot till you vote for it. It's so I might suggest put it, waiting for one election cycle before we put it on the ballot. But, you know, I, I will support it if, I think it needs to be on the ballot. People need to vote for it one way or the other. Um, I don't think it's wise for us to put it on the next ballot, but, you know, if that's what everybody else thinks, then I will support that. Councilmember Martin. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I might agree with the not every single ballot uh, uh, rule of thumb that that uh, Council Member Christensen uh, uh, mentioned. If we were in ordinary times, but we're not, uh, we're going to have a recovery to manage, and we're going to need partners in that recovery. And like other cities who um, engage in public-private partnerships, which really weren't a thing in the 1960s, um, as far as I can tell. Um, uh, we're gonna need those 30-year thir those leases. And uh, I think that we are able, we, are, we need to be able to communicate to the public um, that this is important to the recovery, this is important to the quality of life in Longmont, uh, in enriching um, the city and and attracting people who are willing to invest in the city. We also have a situation now where borrowing is very easy because that's the way we the that's the way the feds make it uh, easy for people to invest, and we need to be able to take advantage of that. So I am hoping that. There, the city's um, the city's potential investors, and you know, I think everyone on the council knows who they are. Um, will get themselves together, form an issue committee, uh, and uh, explain to the public as we can't, other than just by talking here, uh, how important this is going to be, because. Um, I know I got a lot of questions from voters in 2018, and I think the people that I explained it to voted yes. I've gotten letters from a number of them um, who, you know, read the council agenda and said, yeah, I want to vote yes again. I voted for it in 2018, and it wasn't enough votes, so I want to vote for it again. Uh, uh, because that's the difference. I think that that... Uh, People didn't understand what they were voting for, and maybe with more consciousness of the way public finance and pi public-private partnerships work, 
um, they'll get it this time. And the people, the potential investors will, will understand that they need to um, sell their value um, to the public. Because if you ask everybody, uh, you know, who's a homeowner in Longmont, do you think you could have bought your very first home if you'd had to take out a 20 year mortgage? Um, most of them would say, no, I'd still be renting. And um, that's the way public private partnerships work. Our, our, our private investors need a 30 year mortgage too. They need a 30 year lease to get it done. Council Member Waters. Thanks, Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, I, I, I don't I don't think among the council there's there would be disagreement about the value of changing the charter because we agreed to put it on the ballot before for the very reasons that Councilmember Morgan just described. And I want to I, I I think Councilmember Christensen's concerns I share about how how soon you would go back to the ballot and not having it appear as though we're going to keep coming back, you know, over and over again. I, I do remember that Nextlight failed the first time and came back successfully subsequently and was one of the great decisions that, the, that this community made to support um, the creation of our own uh, uh, bandwidth uh, uh, and as a utility. Um, but I, I, I am of a mind as well that these are, these are extraordinary times we live in right now. Um, if I were to go back to the last ballot, we had a number of items or, or questions on that ballot. And from my perspective, my assumption was this would have been a no brainer. There was no cost attached to it. It would pass. And we didn't, we didn't do really anything that I recall to, to explain to the public uh, the relationship between that ballot question and potential investment in Longmont. In the interim, the, uh, con uh, the Performing Arts and Conference Center feasibility study, I think has been completed, although in this, you know, during the pandemic, we haven't, it hasn't had much attention. But if there's any chance of, of moving on any of the recommendations at some point in time, and it won't happen quickly, but it, the prospects are, are not strengthened by limiting the potential length, uh, length of a lease if, if somebody wanted to build something, an investor wanted to build something on city owned property and, and do that in partnership and see it financed both from the private sector and, and some from the public in, in terms of a land uh, deal. Uh, the potential then that something is deeded back to the city at the end of 30 years, that kind of thing. I just think, I think we ought to position Longmont uh, to be as competitive as possible, to be as attractive as possible to investors. And um, we don't have, well, we know we're gonna have a water bond. Well, we don't know that. If we make that decision, there'll be a water bond question on the ballot, but I don't think there'll be anything else. And who knows what would be on the ballot from us and the county and others uh, in, you know, in another election cycle. As long as we don't have other, other uh, or many items, certainly no other cost items other than water bond, I just think this would be the time to do it. It ought to be a good turnout, a big voter turnout in a presidential election year. We've already heard from some elements in the community, LEDP and the chamber, we heard from Scott Cook earlier in the, in the call tonight, that our business community is ready to get behind this. I don't think anybody was behind it last time. So I think even with minimal organization behind it, it's a no brainer to, to help the community understand the value. It doesn't cost anybody anything. It positions Longmont to compete at least equally with municipality, municipalities around us that have already done this to attract investment to Longmont. So I hope that we would, as a council, uh, give our community a chance to support it, get behind it, and, um, and give us a chance to put us in the same kind of competitive position that we see other uh, Boulder County municipalities. Council Member Peck. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I, I also agree. We, we already voted unanimously to put this on the ballot before, so I don't think there's going to be any real discussion about um, should we or should we not put it on the ballot. My, my concern is the passing of it. Uh, and we debriefed about this uh, a couple of months ago, 
and kind of talked about it was it was our marketing strategy or maybe we didn't market it. But we are in a different time right now than we were last uh, November. And uh, people are thinking differently and not are, are thinking more personally. What is going to happen to me? I lost my job. I'm going to be evicted. My rent is going up. My I'm not sure that I'm just playing devil's advocate here a bit. I'm not sure that this is going to be an important issue for them to even uh, consider. Um, because even though the business community is behind it, they're not the only ones voting. And I think we've seen this on many issues that we've put on the ballot is that the surprise that why didn't it pass? And I don't have any problem putting it on the ballot, but if it doesn't pass, I don't want to put it on the ballot again uh, at this point. So that's where I'm stuck. Uh, like, like Councilwoman Christensen, I don't have a problem putting it on the ballot, but I do want it to pass if we do that. And um, when we talked about it before, the virus was not an issue. And personally to every voter who is not a biz in business, who just goes to work every day and is losing their jobs, et cetera, my fear is that they won't uh, consider it at all and, uh, or, or learn about it, but just based upon history on other ballot issues. So. I, I'm for putting it on the ballot if that's the majority. Uh, council member Edalgo Faring, you actually were not on the council at the time we last put this on the ballot. So just wondered if you had any thoughts. Um, no, um, I don't have anything new to add. I think everything that had been kind of mulling through my head has already been stated. I think what um, council member Martin had pointed out about people who are, you know, the, the potential partnership, city business partnership, they really need to come together and start um, getting the word out and educating the public. Um, I think that that is gonna make or break whether or not this passes, is getting getting the word out there to, to the public. So um, yeah, and I, I will be voting to put this back on the ballot. Okay, just a, uh... From my perspective, I guess, uh, I do share the same concerns as far as uh, putting something back on the ballot so quickly after it lost. Uh, real quick question, I don't know if anybody has the numbers, but what was the spread on the votes for when it lost? Um, I can't remember. Sandy, do you remember? Let me look it up real quick. I don't remember, Harold. Yeah, I was going to say, I can look it up if you all want to continue your conversation. Okay. Yeah. So on that note, uh, you know, I think that we all, to a certain degree, a uh, certain degree, came to the consensus that there was a marketing problem the last time that we had this on the ballot. And I heard 2018, but for some reason, I thought it was last year, 2019, that we had it on the ballot. It, well, and be, my point being is that Obviously, in these odd years, we're going through city elections at the same time. And we as council members may get somewhat, maybe not everybody, but some may get a little bit more wrapped up on either their personal campaigns or the other campaigns going on at the time to not give kind of an adequate uh, effort to pushing forward something that we all obviously feel is necessary, but might not make a whole lot of sense to the residents of Longmont. And so I think that it benefits us to try in a year like this, where it is a higher turnout with the presidential election. We're not worrying about any municipal elections as far as seats are concerned. And so I think it would be more advantageous to run it in a year like this than opposed to waiting till next year when there's gonna be another municipal election. And that's just a, you know, something that popped into my head. Council Member Martin. Thank you. A constituent just looked it up a little faster than the assistant city manager did. It was uh, it was uh, uh, sixteen thousand votes against versus thirteen thousand votes for. Uh, so it was really pretty close, only a margin of three thousand votes with no messaging whatsoever. Um, this seems like we could probably close a gap of those proportions. 
Thanks, Council Member Martin. That's 45.47% for and 54.53% against. Quick, quick on the draw. <laughs> so it seems to me that you have consensus pretty much to move <laughs> forward with this with the understanding that we really will have to have some sort of robust communication strategy uh, as far as it's concerned. And I know that, you know, we have to be fairly neutral as far as some of the, the, the issues are, but I think for, you know, my fellow colleagues here on council that in our personal endeavors to make sure that we're doing a really good job of communicating why this is important, why it's a good thing. So, uh, but I think outside of that, we're all, seem to be in agreement and have consensus on this. Is that the direction from council to then bring that back to you all to place it on the ballot? Yep. Yep, I definitely see the head nods, so. All right, I'm good. All right, that, that takes care of the study session items. Uh, now we'll move on to mayor and council comments. Any comments tonight? Uh, council Member Waters. Uh, not a comment so much as a question. <laughs> I've got to look, find our I can't get I can't get to a uh, council calendar beyond August, and I know we got the whole year's worth of, of stuff from um, Maria early in the year, um, but I can't remember where I, which folder I put it in. We got five Tuesdays in September. Are we meeting mm -hmm. on all those five Tuesdays in September? Um, I think we ha we had them available because that's budget time, um, and. Uh, so historically what we've done is I think if we didn't need one, we didn't use it. Um, this budget's going to be um, a bear. So, so, so likely we will need all five. Right, but let me get with um, Jim and Sandy right. in the budget group. And, and an unknown whether, whether we'll be meeting in person or virtually, right? Based on early, our earlier conversation. Correct. All right, okay, thanks. Uh, Councilmember Christensen. Let Councilman Peck go first. All right, Council Member Peck. I feel like I've talked a lot tonight, but thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. And um, so I didn't know at what point in the agenda to bring this up because there really wasn't any. I asked Don to Don Quintana to forward to you a an email that I got with a petition from 350.org Colorado. And basically it is from uh, about 50, uh, 30 individuals and 20 some organizations um, that would like to, us to sign on. This, these organizations, these 30 organizations are not coming to elected officials and city council and commissioners to see if we will sign on a petition to ban fracking in Boulder County. And the reason I think this has come up is because uh, Erie, is being overrun with uh, with all kinds of gas and oil sites that are just outrageously large. Um, they need help. And with SB 181 out there, um, we, I, I actually didn't even know about this until she emailed me and said, would you talk to council about it? So what they were wondering is, to me, it's it's not a heavy lift because we've already, passed in our local home rule to ban fracking in, in Longmont and the county commissioners have put another moratorium on fracking within Boulder County. So um, with this larger organization going to COGCC and uh, trying to get all of the elected officials and the, the municipalities within Boulder County to help each other, basically at this point to help Erie, um, I don't have a problem asking if city council would sign on to this. And I, it is in your email box if you wanted to read that. It's very, very short. Uh, and if you don't wanna do it as a council, I will do it individually. Um, so that's what I would like to know. This, is, this has to be done by Thursday, which is why I'm bringing it up very late. Uh, so, let me know, you know, do you, do you want to sign on this with, uh, as a council body? Do you not want to sign on to it? Uh, it hits all our environmental issues. It hits, uh, it hits our air quality. We're getting alerts all the time. Um, it, it's, it 
supports our air quality monitoring, uh, even though we have taken a, a position of neutral on SB 181. It just supports each other in working as a unit rather than as individually. So that's it. That's my that's comment. Cool. Yeah. Did you, so wouldn't it take a motion and a vote for the council to sign on as a body? Um, and that is for Eugene or Sandy or uh, Harold, or is it just a, a consensus, yeah, that we wanna do this? Well, I think we'd need to, to motion and vote on it as a body if, if that's how we wanna go forward with it, but there would need to be a motion. Okay, uh, Mayor Brown, Tim, I agree. And my, my point was that I didn't know at what point in the agenda to do this. Is it okay to do it at council comments or? Eugene, are you there? He probably doesn't want to answer this question. <laughs> uh, I am here uh, according to the council rules of procedure. Uh, the city should not be taking a uh, final position or official action at study sessions. I would recommend that you suspend the rules of procedure. Um, and if it's uh, representing the city, I, I do think a motion and vote would be needed. Okay. I move to suspend the rules of procedure. So as to be able to make a motion on this. I'll second that. Second. Okay, thank you. We have a, a motion on the floor by Council Member Peck to suspend the rules of procedure and a second by, I think, Council Member Hidalgo Faring. I heard a couple of different people say something. Uh, looks like there might be some discussion. Council Member Waters. Um, yes, thanks, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I, I mean, I, there's not, all of us, in my view, would, would favor uh, banning fracking everywhere. Um, so what I'm, my question isn't about disagreeing with the concept, but as a defendant in a lawsuit um, uh, brought to us to enforce a fat frack, uh, fracking ban, and, a, and we've taken a neutral position in that lawsuit, uh, I guess I, my, I would ask Eugene, uh, how do we, how would we take a vote to sign on to a petition and maintain our position of neutrality? In that lawsuit, and I don't that, that we weren't neutral on on 181. We were neutral on right. on a position in a lawsuit. Right? We all favored 181, but exactly. it, but this is quite different. And I'd want to make certain I'm real clear where the where the lines are that I don't want to cross. And I would say just as an editorial comment, the 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 people and the organizations uh, about which uh, Councilmember Peck is referring, you know, to cooperating with one another, not one of them. Uh, approached us to ask how did we feel about being sued to enforce what the court had already told us we couldn't enforce and to spend more tax dollars. I mean, I, I don't want to get too wrapped up in it, but I, I still honestly have a little bit of an edge on about being sued by our friends uh, to cover the cost for other people who would like to see fracking bans imposed in Boulder County. Um, so that doesn't feel like in the spirit of of cooperating with one another, that's the way it should be approached. But that's the way it was approached. And now on short notice, the question is, would you sign a petition to do exactly what people didn't do for us? So um, I have an issue with that, but I'm more, I'm more concerned about the legal status as defendants in a lawsuit in which we've chosen to take a neutral position, Eugene. Mayor and Council, you know, that was the direction that Council gave me for the litigation. I'm going to carry that out until it's changed by a majority of Council. You know, I, I think this is somewhat of a separate matter. Uh, I, I will follow the direction and handling the litigation as directed by Council. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Waters. Uh, just to go forward here, uh, I appreciate the, the question as well as the answer from the city attorney, but we are specifically talking about a active motion to suspend rules of procedure. So if it's not pertinent to that or germane to that, uh, is it, Councilmember Martin, do you have comment on that specifically? Uh, no, I'm willing to suspend the rules of procedure, assuming that we will have discussion on the matter after that. I'm just staying in the queue since we don't have life. 
Absolutely. Um, so I guess seeing no other discussion on the motion on the table, all those in favor of suspending rules of procedure to allow for a motion and vote during a study session, say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Nay. The motion passes five to one with council member Waters dissenting and mayor Bagley absent. All righty. Uh, now that the rules of procedure have been suspended, can I, do I hear a motion? Council Member Peck. Okay, I move that as a, uh, as a council, we sign on to the 350.org Colorado petition to ban fracking in Boulder County. Second. I have a motion by Council Member Peck to sign on to the petition uh, as referenced to ban fracking in Boulder County or be in support of banning fracking in Boulder County in a second by Council Member Christensen. Council Member Martin. Uh, I have a, a number of concerns. The, the first one is I'm hesitant to vote for anything I haven't read. And I don't think that even if we took a moment for us to all read what's in our mailboxes now, um, you know, under the pressure, I'm not sure I would consider that a, a, a thorough reading, at least not the way um, my, my mind works. Um, the other question I have is uh, how much it helps Erie um, as a former Erie resident. A whole bunch of Erie is in Weld County and a smaller bit of Erie is in Boulder County. And we're cert certainly not going to get a fracking ban in Weld County any until the state does it. Um, so or the, or the industry collapses, which is where I'm putting my money. Um, but at any rate, um, I think that, that that is a concern that it maybe does not have the desired effect and uh, takes uh, Boulder County's eye off the ball. But Boulder County has just in, uh, extended the moratorium and the moratorium uh, stops drilling in the Boulder County part of Erie just as well as a band would. Uh, and, uh, and then finally, I'm not sure us acting as a council does not you know, have, have some impact on, on where we stand in the lawsuit. If, if we come out as a body for fracking bands, um, then does that allow us to remain neutral in the lawsuit or not? Um, because if uh, the plaintiffs win this lawsuit, Longmont, in my opinion, could be in the position of paying for the fracking ban twice in a lot of ways. Um, is Scott uh, Converse mentioned my interview with, with Mike Foote. Um, that was done on Longmont Public Media. And, uh, you know, he admitted that, that uh, Longmont has already spent a lot of money on a fracking ban um, and then, you know, found other ways to get fracking uh, out of Longmont. Um, and I would just like to not have the people of Longmont have to pay uh, for this fight again because I think we've done our share. Um, so I will not be voting to endorse this motion as a body. Um, sometimes think longer than things take longer than um, uh, we thought. And so maybe there will be an opportunity for us to do that when we're prepared to do it. But I'm not going to vote for it tonight. I don't see any other discussion, so I guess that takes us to the vote. All those in favor of signing as a body to the 350.org petition to ban fracking in Boulder County, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. 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 Motion passes four to two with council members Water, council member Martin dissenting, with, count, uh, with Mayor Bagley absent. Thank you. Are there any other uh, mayor and council comments? Council member Christensen.
Uh, thank you. I, um, I would like to be indulged for a little bit here because we lost uh, two extremely courageous and uh, important and powerful leaders in the civil rights movement last Friday, the same day. And so I would like to read a few things. Um, part of this is from uh, Jamal Smith's um, article, America Failed John Lewis and C.T. Vivian. C.T. Vivian and John Lewis met at the uh, Baptist Theological Seminary, which uh, makes me happy because I was raised as an American Baptist. Um, and that was the heart of one of the hearts of the civil rights movement. Um, so in 2015, Vivian was asked on Democracy Now! whether full voting, voting rights had been achieved. He said, there is nothing we haven't done for this nation. We've died for it, but it's been overlooked what we've done for it. We kept knowing the scriptures, we kept living by faith, we kept understanding that it's something deeper than politics that makes life worth living. Um, so here's what Smith wrote. Um, it is admirable, certainly, but this kind of valor is unfortunate necessity in a nation that continues to fail Black people and other Americans of color. Congressman John Lewis and Reverend C.T. Vivian employed their intellect and altruism for incredible benefit, and they are two of the finest Americans who ever lived, but they shouldn't have needed to be. Those today who have similar talents should be free to exhibit moral clarity in ways that go beyond the battles for basic human rights in the supposed land of the free. As we both mourn and celebrate these men, we need to demand more of the country that sadly continues to require their brand of heroism. Here's what John Lewis said. And keep in mind that this is a man who fought for and achieved the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, the Fair Housing Act, the labor, labor law, and all of these things have been rolled back and rolled back and rolled back since the mid 70s and especially the 80s. But this is what he said about the latest um, things with Black Lives Matter. Sorry, I have very little light. <laughs> It was very moving, very moving to see hundreds of thousands of people from all over America and around the world take to the streets to speak up, to speak out, to get into what I call good trouble. This feels and looks so different, he said of the Black Lives Matter movement that drove the anti-racism demonstrations. It's so much more massive and all-inclusive. And this time, he said, there will be no turning back. So those are our marching orders to make, to make, to be not turning back, to move forward and to harden up all those things that we have lost, that we have allowed to drift away. We need to fight for them all over again and make sure they don't disappear. Thanks. All right, uh, last call for council comments. Seeing none, moving on, city manager remarks. Um, I did uh, forward you all um, council an email I found uh, regarding some of your questions concerning um, COVID spread um, with different populations. It was on the CDC website, it appeared about five days ago. I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Um, other than that, um, obviously I haven't had time to read it, but it was a CDC document, so I felt I could share it. Other than that, no comments. Thank you, Harold. City Attorney remarks? No comments, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Eugene. All right, I move adjournment. Second. Second. All in favor of adjournment, say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes unanimously. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.